This episode of the Rainbow Brain Skull Podcast is brought to you by me. Go to my store and buy my stuff. No discount. You pay full price now. Fine. If you go to rainbowbrainskull.com and use the code PODCAST, you get a discount off of my art and shirts and stuff, and it's a good store. And you've been to all the other stores. You know what that's like. You know what BarkBox and Stamps.com and Audible and and Dollar Shave Club and all that stuff is. How about coming over to my little store and looking around there and, and buying buying all the things in the stream? Just oh, whatever. Let's do the actual podcast. How about that? You probably want that more. Most people skip the intros. Intros are stupid. I don't even know why I do mine. I'm already doing too much of it right now. Okay, now it's just... Okay, uh, my guest today is artist slash musician slash all-around cool dude slash my new friend... Colin Frangicetto, hit it! Welcome to the Rainbow Prince Call Hour. You're gonna have a good real time today. Every week there's a new guest, so that you'll learn something new. That's all that we're here to do. I was gonna finger point and like stage dive. What you <laughs> Hit <laughs> it, which I've already said. Do you sound okay? I sound pretty good. I think. Do you wish you were louder? Do you wish I was softer? No, you sound good. I I wish my voice sounded different, but you know I can't really help that. What's wrong with your voice? Your voice is good. I feel like I always I just you know when I listen to it, I'm like, man, I sound like nasally. I don't know. I just really have this thing. I see yeah. you as having a a deeper like kind of rich sound, and it might be because of in interviews the contrast between you and Anthony. He's got a, like an octave higher <laughs> yeah. voice in a good way. I mean, that's his, his skill his is that he has that, that voice. But I like the contrast of it. They're asking him one thing and it's like, well, what's that? and then you're like, well, we thought with this record it would be more, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're deep in it. How did, you, how did you find me? How did you learn about all this? Oh, boy. What a tangled web. Um, you know what? Let me make sure I turn this off right now so it doesn't. Yeah, me too. What if we us? just left this all in? I don't care. The <laughs> listeners are so laid back. Yeah, I'm all about it. I love the realness, you know. Um, I think there there comes in waves. Like, so let's say there's there's normal radio programs, and then someone like Mark Marin and podcasters come along, uh-huh. and then they kind of hit scale, and they have Obama on and stuff, and their <laughs> listeners are still there. But I, as a listener, I find myself gravitating towards the podcasts that have like less than a thousand listeners. Not that I know their numbers, but I can just kind of get a feel for like, no one's heard of this one before, but Absolutely. it's more, it's more real. And yeah. then hopefully one day I'll become one of those ones that gets washed over and then even, <laughs> even fewer people. And then we just get micro and micro and, and micro or it's the new, it's the new punk rock. Fuck. Yeah. It's almost like, yeah, I feel like the concept that almost everybody is going to have their own podcast one day it's like the way we we're gonna just communicate to the world it's almost like the way we're gonna blog and um yeah i I think sometimes i even forget about the concept of them being curated in that way and remember that's that was like our first kind of interaction where i was like hey i should be on your podcast and uh you know i just had that moment afterwards listening to that one episode and hearing how that's kind of a, a weird thing and then and i was like oh yeah I'm that fucking asshole. I actually, I felt, I felt bad about triggering that in you because the way the interaction actually went down was you Instagram messaged me saying that you, you liked the podcast. (laughs) If you're ever in shortage of guests, let me know. And I just wrote back like, uh, Oh, I I appreciate that, man. Thank you very much. And I didn't really think about it one way or the other. I was just like onto the next thing. And then when Barbara Gray's in here and we're just talking shit because it was one of those like things we're good at just talking (laughs) shit to each other. And it was more the angle of, I don't know if we were talking about podcasts or live shows, but the assumption of, especially in LA, like, hey, put me on your show. And like, you've never been to my show. You don't know the thing of it. And I know that you're just blanket blasting everyone of the thing. And then then you sent me this message, like, I just listened to the Barbara Gray episode. I I totally (laughs) asked you to be on the the podcast. And I go, just the fact that you listen to it, like, I'll totally have you on. And I didn't really know about Circa. And it's kind of been puzzling me because I... I loved AFI and Thrice and I'm not putting you guys in like yeah. you're just like those bands, but you're you're on the bill with those bands and uh-huh. you've been around since two thousand 
four. Yeah. And uh-huh. and I was in that like that what lack of a better word, my space scene. Sure. Black t shirts, punk shows, totally. uh post emo hardcore, mm-hmm. like fun ass shows. I like the the way you described it as playing on the floor. When you play mm-hmm. on the floor, you and the audience, there's no separation. When you play on a stage, then totally. and it's a mindset, not just the uh, actual physical part of it. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, how did how did I not know about you guys? Did you not play in Texas, or it, was it just oh, no, in my blind spot? Yeah, I think I think we're in a lot of people's blind spot. And to be honest, it's almost like just I'm more. I'm more blown away when someone has heard of the band, you know, I've kind of programmed my thinking in that way, even at like, I think maybe when I was less self-aware and, you know, we were like in our major label stage and, you know, we had videos on MTV and all this crap and like, uh, like a song on the radio, it still was so much more normal for people to say circus. What? What, bit, what circus? What? Right, yeah, like like what bit? Because I, I have like a little bit of a lisp too. So anytime I say it, it's like inevitable that I have to say it again. Do it again. I didn't catch it. Circus survive? No, you did it right that time. Okay. I'll yeah, catch yeah. you another yeah, time. Yeah, but you I will. haven't caught a lisp. And yeah. so just for listeners out here, Colin and I, Colin and I, this is the first time we've we've met in person. But we've been we've been texting and stuff back yeah. and forth and Instagramming and yeah. like been playing this little game of like. Yeah trying to learn as much of each other before getting on the podcast so we don't ask the the obvious questions and so that we have a foundation yeah. to work with. And, um, yeah, like you talked about McKenna, mm-hmm. a lot Terrence McKenna, and I'm just thinking to myself, tell me if you do this. Do you mm-hmm. do that thing where, uh-oh, there's a podcast coming up. I better I better listen to all this this information so of that I'll course. be a good podcaster when mm-hmm. it goes out the window anyway, once totally. you're sitting here. So it's all about trying to be uh, in this moment rather than yes. regurgitate something that a dead man said about reality, <laughs> which which he didn't even believe towards the end of his life. He, he was, you know, he, he kind of met that void, that nothingness. Like mm-hmm. there's no, there's no way of actually articulating the model of what all this is. It's just kind of for fun. Yeah for us yeah how does that make you feel like when you what well, i noticed that you you you're intrigued by death obviously as well and or at least you're consumed by it in a subject way like a subjective way um like when you like for me i kind of get a little bit of a, a chill and um i don't know when i look at like last interviews or i'm just kind of like going down that rabbit hole of of someone's whole life and their accomplishments and then i start getting towards the end and you start, I don't know, you just start to kind of pay attention to where were they like before that happened? Like where were they mentally? Um, what was going on? Like did did everything that they kind of espoused during their life kind of come out? Like this, like McKenna, you know, he talked about death so much. He talked about um, the afterlife so much and just all these other things. And I just wonder, yeah, I don't know. I just... I don't know. I I felt a little bit of sadness towards the end of his life in a strange way. Towards the end of McKenna's? Yeah. Like, Were you aware of him at the time? Because I got onto him after like a decade after he was dead already, I think. I just found him basically right around the time that he died. And um, I didn't feel anything then. But now when I like watch his like his later interviews and when he knows that, you know, he's kind of on the way out soon um, and you can, you know, there's all that kind of talk about how he didn't, you know, he got scared off of the mushrooms for a long time and kind of was just like, I don't know. I, there's just something about that last saga of his life that I don't know. It just makes me, I don't know. It makes me a little sad. I don't what know about with, um, I guess cause he talked about it so much and you, you want, as he would put it, like you want that build up the denouement so you can just leave the theater, just satisfied, like, ah, we did it. But yeah, it's one of those ones that, Unlike, let's take, uh, are you a big David Bowie fan? I like David Bowie quite a bit. Did you get uh, into Black Star and did you experience the whole thing of not seeing him for 10 years, then seeing that video and realizing, oh man, he's he's dying. I haven't seen him in 10 years and that's actually what he looks like. And then sure enough, he was dead yeah. that week. He had a perfect swan song, I thought. He, he totally. exited perfectly in the Lazarus video where he goes back into the closet wearing that old outfit from the... 
the yeah. 70s he did it he died uh, a perfect way yeah and he integrated it into his art and it and made it all kind of tie together like some fucking genius director or something um but yeah like so many of us won't get that <laughs> yeah or actually let's let's take it the other way we'll probably do even more his his thing's gonna look like child's play if we live another 20 years yeah the way this thing is ramping up yeah like just think of albums and how special they were where they're these big artifacts and you're like i have this album look oh, at the yeah. art of it now i can pull up any album not all of them because i know a lot of them are lost and vinyl and stuff but mm-hmm. basically the albums people have heard of i can pull up on my phone and they're just they're like a half inch by half inch square and you can see all of prince's records and there it is that's it he started with that one ended with that one and died two years ago and mm-hmm. here i am and if i focused i could release more records than him within that 100%. time span because just with less than a hundred bucks you can have better stuff than what the beatles recorded with <laughs> right yeah um i'm so glad we're going in this direction uh yeah i've been thinking about this so much and i was thinking about how a super profound moment for me was um like the age of getting the external hard drive like you know like it was like probably a couple years into the band um, probably should have happened before that. Of but circa, yeah, yeah. Because you circa. guys were both in different. He was uh, Anthony was in Seosin, and yeah, you yeah. were in uh, Days. Um, <laughs> Close. With, with, with this push, day forward. This day forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. there we go. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, I'm I'm a B student. Oh, dude, please. <laughs> it was so much. It's like unreal. I feel, I felt like I was like losing information about you as I was like walking here, and then in my Uber, I'm like. Uh, uh, you know, gold dust slipping through the fingers. No, actually, I like it both ways. I don't want you to know everything about about me or even the fact that you've listened to this podcast. It's actually kind of putting me in a good space because I know I can't I can't say that one uh-huh. thing about, you know, holofractal or about <laughs> about simulation. Th- like, I can't go that, down that Thomas before. Campbell. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Do you yeah. get into Tom Campbell? Um, I, I have through you. I, I actually, uh, you were the first person to kind of put him in my mind. And I actually had like a, a difficult time remembering his name at a certain point um, as I was going to look him up. So then I had to like retrace it and find where you mentioned him. Luckily, you mentioned him a few times. So yeah. um, he came up. But yeah, I yeah I find him to be really cool. All I, these guys are really doing is what I see at the end of the day. They're just taking oneness and telling you that it's oneness Mm -hmm. and then finding a way to divvy it up in a way that is understandable and they just have a way of talking not that it's con art or anything but it's 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 you get attached to the way they speak whether it's um, oh a hundred percent McKenna or Campbell or Nassim Harriman or uh Alan Watts like you that rhythm gets Mm -hmm. infectious so then you can apply it to your own life when it's that voice in your head instead of your own voice I feel like you're a lot more productive but go back to the hard drive the external hard drive oh yeah good you brought it back I'm trying to be a good concept Sherpa so that that I stick pins and things and then because it must be infuriating for listeners if we start something and, and then, then don't finish it. Yeah, and then yeah. we're fine because we're just here. But if yeah. they're listening in their car or something like this podcast sucks dick. <laughs> what about the hard drive? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like an exit existential moment of sorts where, you know, I was grappling with getting rid of my CD collection at the time because I was moving from like one small place to another small place and was like, you know, what, I just I'm not doing this anymore there's all these mp3s whatever and i made that that break from the cd i gave them all to my sister and um i was a guy that had like multiple cd booklets and like you know they always were with me like just the the huge yeah me too yeah you know and i just had to have them with me even if i went on a little were you a burner too oh hell yeah (laughs) you had to be a burner um like yeah and i remember like Oh God! How exciting it was the first time I got like the the function of being able to burn CDs endlessly was like so intoxicating. Um, but yeah, like I remember for the first time ripping like my collection and having everything there in MP3, and then the backing it up all on a hard drive and just seeing my entire collection folders, folders, folders. Like all of a sudden, it wasn't like unique artwork and on um, like this like illusion of just all these worlds all of a sudden it was just information and it was just like all these folders and i realized we were just a folder like circa was just a folder and i'm just like wow like all of a sudden it just really hit me and i i like remember like i'm not gonna sit with this alone guys we're just a folder (laughs) you know what i mean like and i feel like 
that was almost like our as a band that was the band like having their first psychedelic experience understanding that we were just a folder yeah and, and two of you are woo woo and the other three are more not like complete materialist but more leaning skeptical yeah. than uh, yeah. than woo woo yeah i would say well i would say um we got like yeah anthony and i are probably king woo we're like we're, we're definitely like neck and neck but um brendan is for sure on like he he he's like right in the middle he'll go either way um but he leans more, I think, you know, skeptical, logical. Um, it's a weird mindset because I used to be like that too. And you kind of learn. Were you ever in a just really atheist phase? After you get through it, yes. you kind of you, you hit a wall with it. You, you, do. you realize that it can't, there's too many synchronicities and coincidences and mm -hmm. um, another McKenna line, or maybe he just lifted it from someone else. But a coincidence is what you have left over when you have a bad theory and mm. you can't have just too many of those sitting around because then your model is just shaky and yeah. not that you have the model that explains it without those but it's it's not the answer you get it wrong on the test like yeah. your your woo woo answer might not be right but so is the random like i've talked about this before how where does the number of random come from there's no such thing in computers a random number generator it's all right it's all comes from somewhere it's just relatively random oh god that's a good one yeah I'll, i'm gonna think about that one later tonight um yeah i think like it's so true how like the atheist mindset is like i have a lot of respect for basically all points of view but um you know my my father is pretty much a, a staunch atheist and um many people i know identify as as, as atheist and um i never have I, but i've gone through phases where i essentially felt like that where i was like yeah it's probably nothing and that's okay you know i kind of was like sitting with that and i felt like it was important whether i was going to believe that or not that i grapple with that idea and find um an acceptance of that idea yeah and yeah. let's look at that word nothing mm. so we have this idea of in our head as space or nothingness as being void mm -hmm. and not having anything but then when you look at the physics it's the most violent energetic high energy physics there is the mm -hmm. vacuum mm -hmm. that's where all the energy comes from and uh, it's not just esoteric stuff like John Wheeler would say that Feynman would say it uh, Max Planck would say it it's it's all these like really just hardcore physical physicists saying that space isn't empty it's infinitely dense and that's kind exactly. of the twist and then when you look at phrases like nothing lasts forever you're like oh shit and it's like <laughs> oh it's all nothing oh of course it is yeah, it's course it we're is. we're witnessing just infinity dance within itself and it's mm. all interconnected and it's yeah. all one thing and that doesn't do that doesn't do stuff for some people but it's it does so much for me yeah me too and yeah. i think it's just how you how you look at it in your head when you look at it as all one some the people that don't like it are like oh then i'm not a me i'm just like a cell and a big thing and i don't matter it's like no you matter as much as the whole thing because you're the you the whole it. thing the whole thing wants to help you because you're a piece of it like if there yes. was if part of you was on fire of course you'd want to put you on out uh, like on fire so the universe wants you to not be on fire mentally physically yeah. all that if you communicate to it correctly and that's where all all esoteric woo woo knowledge when you when you get down to it the point of it is thoughts are causative mm. thoughts create reality and that's why okay, we're here in this three dimensional space is to learn to be better manifestors mm. i think i always have to you know put that yeah, at the yeah, end yeah. of it i think <laughs> but cuz imagine if you you know that terrible thought we have when you're walking by a cop like what if i took their gun and like ran off with it what if i jumped in that we have those little thoughts so if we the don't have the, the perverse that's what it's called i got obsessed with that concept of um in any situation you're gonna gr your mind's gonna gravitate to what's the worst thing that i could do what's the what's the most um dangerous thing i could do what's the most uh unthinkable thing i could do and i got obsessed with that thing what is that fucking thing what makes me scared of myself that i'm gonna throw myself off the empire state building when i'm at the top like um, and then I looked into this concept of the imp of the perverse, and that's just um, 
you know, this thing. It's a suck. The imp of the perverse, like yeah. imp, like the little yeah. like elf evil guy. Uh huh. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, it's really a it's a beautiful turn of phrase. I I think it I think it may have came from Poe. I actually think that Edgar Allan Poe may have been the first person to say that, and then it got implied um, as like this uh, weird like thought and. To be honest, I don't know if that's the exact um, definition of it. I've found that definition of it easily, being like, "Was this the thing?" And the imp, <laughs> it's the imp of the perverse. But um, then I've seen other definitions that are a little more broad and not so specific. So I don't know if somehow you know I made that definition what it is. I but like it. Yeah, where like it as it is. Yeah. So you and I, you and I are both like these characters that are even though we experience synchronicities and magic and all that kind of thing, mm-hmm. it's like we're constantly trying to reprove it, even though it's proved itself to totally. us. It's like we need to prove to ourselves we live in a magical world. Mm-hmm. And then there's skeptical people that want to prove we live in a materialist world so that no one can pull a fast one on them again. Because <laughs> I feel like a lot of them were yeah. brought up very religiously and like, oh, shit, you fooled me. You're not yeah. fooling me this time. It's only Dawkins and the cartoon version of Charles Darwin, which right? he never said a lot of the stuff he gets quoted for. And even scar tissue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people with the uh, people give, if you go on the woo woo, like subreddits and things like that and hear people take what Neil deGrasse Tyson says or Michio Kaku and be like, they're shills and they're trying to keep the magic away or something. <laughs> it's like, no, you're not listening to them. They they think the world is magic too. They're just using different words mm-hmm. and chopping it up differently. But I remember, uh, was it Michio Kaku saying that Harry Potter, nothing in Harry Potter defies the laws of physics. Mm-hmm. It's all just physics we haven't figured out yet. Yeah. And uh Steven Tyler and Neil deGrasse Tyson once were talking and Steven Tyler, you know, he carries a crystal ball with him everywhere and has yeah. crystals and is off the deep end. <laughs> he he was saying like, well, he basically bringing up like do you think stars could be alive and it's not just a stupid ball of gas like it's something and then Neil deGrasse Tyson wasn't rolling his eyes at him. It's like, oh, perhaps we need to expand our definition of life then. <laughs> and I'm like, hell yeah, yeah. He he believes in magic. He's just not, he's totally. a nerd. He has to know more things. So of course he's not going to believe the moon landing conspiracies and stuff because he's got more information oh, than totally. we do. But of I course. don't know that information he knows. He's, at the end of the day, he's just a cartoon to me. I've never met him. Exactly. He's a guy that you... Um, apparently don't want to hang out at a party with. That's like the joke that everybody says about him. But I'm like, I would want to be at a party with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, like uh, I think specifically that Steven Tyler conversation was at a party on YouTube. I just <laughs> so, clicked on it from some, I don't know how I ended up there, but it's fun to go on those YouTube rabbit holes. Oh man, I love that. Are you a big, in, it sounds maybe like if you're like me, do you like interviews a lot? Um, are you kidding me? So... Uh, in my uh, Ramin uh, research, I was basically going down because I've never, I've always had an appreciation for Zappa, and I've always had an appreciation for Prince, but I've I've never like really done deep dives, and I've never really like just let them fucking you know blow my mind, and so that's been part of my journey recently of like, um, you know, learning about Zappa and learning about Prince in a deeper way than what I was aware of, and. Man, I just put this, uh, it was 10 hours of Zappa interviews. Oh, cool. And I was just watching them, and they were just all linked up. They're all um, different, uh, you know, all different outlets and everything, all different points of time in his career. And, um, you know, there's parts where I'm like, oh, no, he's coughing a lot. Oh, no. Like, you know (laughs) what I mean? Like, you're like, man, all those cigarettes, they're catching up with you, Frank. Like, you know, but... uh, Fuck, Tobacco's man. my favorite vegetable. That <laughs> might not be your idea of a good time, but that's my idea of a good time. Dude. So, you know, you can kiss my ass. Perfect, dude. <laughs> uh, dude, I was like really blown away, though, by some of his interviews, some um, really chilling stuff that I was like, yeah, he's definitely like has a prophetic kind of nature to him. The way he 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 talked about mental health so much um, in these really like, you know, super brutally honest ways, but like really important ways it's almost like you just wish like man i wish people had paid more attention to what he was saying here and not like not like the fireworks of it but like the the meat of it and what he's getting at is like really important yeah he was he was a great mind and a character and yeah. like so salty and just even to this day it's fun to watch videos of him from the 80s and it's yeah like it's still relevant the yeah. I think that mental health one there's 
there's like a one minute sound bite about it, how it's the main thing. If you fix that one, you're going to fix all these other yeah. problems. And he wasn't even a drug guy, just loved cigarettes and, yeah. uh, and coffee. And sex. Yeah, yeah and yeah. sex. The yeah. blow job. <laughs> The guitar solo is for the blowjob. When a guitar player steps on, he's like has this big section on his book about guitar solos are just because the guitar player wants to get a blowjob or something. And like he's that. obsessed with uh, getting politicians laid by prostitutes. And like, it's so great. Like, I just think it's so, it's perfect. Like, I get what he's saying, you know what I mean? And I, it's just kind of funny to put yourself back in time and imagine what people were thinking like hearing this and be like oh my god like you know but he was just making a lot of sense to me yeah and he'll he'll make you if you really dive deep in which sounds like you already have but people like him and prince give me an appreciation for just what we have now to record music like it's so easy and he had to work so hard to try to get orchestras to play his his dots on a page and they wouldn't play it so he couldn't hear it unless an orchestra actually played it, and then eventually they like the people at the very cutting edge could have computers that played kind of shitty midis of, <laughs> yeah, of the versions it. of it. And like <laughs> that if he saw what we had now and aren't using it, he would just be like, What are you what are you doing? Yeah, totally. And do you have a lot of resistance with that at all? Like as a musician, do you are you um do you like wish you were putting out more stuff or you like feel comfortable with the amount of stuff you, you put out? Um I think like it's been a long journey, let's put it that way. But like, you know, in the beginning of the band, uh, in the beginning of Circa, especially, um, that's when I was really in this phase of making full band ideas all the time. Like I would, you know, because I can play drums, I can play bass and guitar. And that's really all you need, like to put a song together. I mean, really, that's more than what you need at this point. But um, back then, you know, the the drummer brain and logic wasn't as awesome as it is now you know what i mean so you know my whole like motivation to learn any instrument just enough was i just want to be able to record a demo myself without depending on this asshole that won't come over to my house and do this thing (laughs) you know what i mean just like i gotta do this myself um so for me like i was obsessed with recording all the time just making idea after idea and i think in my mind for a long time i was like i'm going to be the, a guy that just puts out shit endlessly and blah 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 and um i think you know time catches up with you in a way where it's like you know nothing's for free even though you get those those blasts of inspiration and you get like those weekends where you can just pump out ideas or whatever when you're in a band you have to decide at a certain point, is it going to be a democracy or is this going to be, you know, a dictatorship? And I think for us right from the get go, it was like, no, we're a democracy. Yeah. Like, we're, I like a, that. we're a collaboration. That's what, ma- that's what makes us special. That's what makes us what we are. And, um, you know, for me, I think there was frustration earlier on, not just me, probably Anthony as well. Cause I think at that point we just had this like, yeah, let's just fucking make shit all the time. And I think like Brendan has always been this lesson for me, like because he's very slow moving and slow talking and and when we and he's kind of hard to read. And when we write together, him and I are almost like like, you know, yin and yang in a lot of ways. And um, but one thing that's just at least for a long time, he may be capable of it now, to be honest, but. For a long time, he wasn't able to just commit to an idea and go, right? It In was what like, way? He would keep changing it? Or he would what? want to change it. He, he would kind of like not be sure about a song, if it should be on the record, if it should go past a certain point, if it even should be any more energy spent on it. Um, but, you know, he's just methodical and just has his thing that he has to do. And he's a brilliant guitar player and I've learned so much from him. But it's also like for a while it was challenging because I just wanted to like, I'm like, no, it's not about like making everything perfect. It's about like, you know, getting all these great ideas out to people and having them have their thing with it. Like that's all it is. Like, um, so for me, I think I just learned like, okay, like I want that to be harmonious. I want circuit to be what it's supposed to be, whatever it's going to be. Um, at one point I thought I'm, I'm like the main music writer, 
uh, Brendan's the cake direct decorator with like all his fancy <laughs> leads, you know, and Anthony's like the mad genius lyricist uh, vocalist guy. And, you know, it only took a few years for me to figure out like, no, that, that's not what it is. You're just a band. You're just a band who all have different visions and you all can like take turns playing different roles. And that's what makes it beautiful. And to be honest, that's why I think we're still here, you know, 14, almost 15 yeah, years later. Yeah, that's crazy. By yeah. band standards, like, that's that's incredible. And you still like each other. and you oh, still, We love each other. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is it comfy on the road now that you're at this point in the career? Do you guys have a bus and all yeah. that stuff? And um, your needs are met? It's not like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, This no. again. Um, yeah, no, we... So our... We were one of those weird bands where we just got so lucky out of the gate. A lot of things lined up and um, we did not expect A, to last long. You know, in my mind, I thought we'd put out two records maybe. Um, I didn't really think it would become this really huge part of my life the way it has. I don't think any of us really perceived that. We wished for it, but we didn't like... We had all been around the the band at least once before with another band. So yeah. you, you get protective and you're like, I'm not going to uh, expect too much. You know what I mean? So I think, um, yeah, we got lucky and a lot of things lined up and we had a, like a great booking agent before we ever played a show. We yeah, had, you mentioned that on uh, on Third Eye Drops, which yeah. listeners, you should listen to this afterwards if you want to hear more of, of that. But something else you said on there, I loved that for the first record, the way the formula was, what if we all just came together with our parts and mm-hmm. didn't tell each other what to do and see yeah. what, what makes it? And I thought that was just such a beautiful uh, formula because there's, there's unlimited formulas of how you can make a record, like totally. how you produce it or what the roles of people are in it. And that's just such a cool way of going about doing it. Dude. And the booking agent, I imagine that you got that because you guys had existing clout from other mm-hmm. bands. I think you said that there was a record label that was like, okay, yeah, maybe. And then they saw you with, with Anthony and I was like, is that, is that the guy from Sayo Sounds? Like, yeah, he's just my buddy. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll sign you. <laughs> like it's just your it's casual, uh, yeah. you know, future Kurt Cobain guy. Yeah. Not Kurt it's, Cobain, but you know, they were at that exactly. Nirvana thing as you yeah. described them to me. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I always had that perception of like Sayo like, you know, I, I actually went, um, down the rabbit hole a c- couple of years ago and I was like trying to find um, this <laughs> on tripod. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. Oh, but yeah. That, yeah. So like um, finding the, the first This Day Forward blogs like from when I'm pretty sure, yeah, I was in high school. Okay, so I was in high school and I was like, I would, they were blogs, but they weren't blogs because blogs didn't happen yet. But I was just making these, these I would write like a, diary almost like played a show uh i really like i remember writing this thing it was like oh yeah like so crazy to play with you and i and nora these bands that i've looked up for like <laughs> and all these bands like no one even knows what who, who these bands are but like they um but there's this moment where i'm like saw this band audience of one singer is incredible um that's anthony's band back then and i was just like you know one of the coolest voices i've ever heard like and i'm just saying it you know, after playing a show, for, I've never even met him yet. And I'm looking at that like, wow, even then, like his vocals and just his whole thing had an impact on me when I first met him as a young That's dude. That's crazy. And yeah. you, you like, l- not lured him away from his group and yeah. started a new one, but that's it, that's how it played out. He left yeah. the other group and then you guys formed a thing that was even more solid. And yeah. now Sayosin is back yeah. with, with the original lineup, except for one bloke. Uh, yeah, and with, with Anthony, and it's really cool. I, I love looking at Wikipedia, that grid where you can see the lineups of people, and then it's like, which one of you is the solid bar that connects <laughs> all of it? Right. And then sometimes, I, I can't bring up an example, but some bands, there's never been a solid all-the-way guy. Right. Like, some point, it changes. <laughs> like, well, what are you? It's like a moving... Yeah, it's totally... Yeah, it's a fluid fluid thing much like our bodies like the cells are constantly rotating in and out or not the cells it, the the atoms are but the cells yeah. are constantly dividing and you know yeah. actual science stuff that people can look up don't, <laughs> don't listen to me i i like quote joe rogan experience incorrectly do you know how bad the information on this podcast is <laughs> Maybe it goes all the way. Maybe it goes full circle. Like I'm so wrong <laughs> quoting stuff that it it becomes you, hard. You science. get quoted 
on Joe Rogan and then hear somebody else say something that was an incorrect quote from you. (laughs) (laughs) That's probably like what's happening at this point. That's like, I'm just so convinced that we're all like, you know, in this weird loop of time where we're somehow affecting ourselves in that weird way. But um, we are. And uh, it's only ramping up more. And some people find it scary, but I just see it as this wave that if you're learning to ride it, then, oh man, we're at, it's it's not even started yet. It's mm-hmm. uh, this is a Gary Vaynerchuk line. He says we're we're at the national anthem of a 19 inning game right now. Yes, like the internet is just in its early phases of doing what it's going to do. And now he doesn't even say that. Now he says I used to say it's the national anthem of a 19 inning game, but it's we're we're planning on driving to the place to tailgate prior to the national anthem, prior mm. to the game. It's such early phases of, oh, of all this stuff. So true, man. And, like, I loved uh, what you were saying in the podcast with Shane about um, how you see it as, like, eventually we won't even, you know, we're just going to, like, have a frequency that connects to, like, the internet or whatever it is. Um, And I, I've been thinking about that for a long time, just, like, you know, especially when you see you know, like the body hacking people, the people who are like constantly doing these modifications to like interface technology, like biohacking, you know? Yeah, Um, I feel like it's, I appreciate them, but it's going to look, the way that plastic surgery 10 years ago oh, looks yeah. now or CGI looks now, it, it, it's oh, not yeah. going to last well. So people putting magnets in their fingertips, no, like, no, no, yeah. ooh, it's not going to be good in five years. No, they're the punks. They're like, they're definitely like, they're they're pushing, they're pushing that whole movement um, in a way uh, that I think what they're doing is they're spreading awareness of the fact that this is like a desired thing by a lot of people, like, this idea to you know kind of supersize yourself like oh yeah i think i'll just like do this to my hearing and i'll do this to my vision and i would love to do this with that and um yeah that's just going to be we're not even going to think about it yeah if point. anyone can be anyone's avatar yeah there's um didn't they talk about it in that Ready Player One book where everyone in that virtual world can be attractive? So like like the conventionally attractive people aren't attractive anymore. The people that look like what their actual self looks like and you can just kind of tell, you develop a feel for it. Like mm-hmm. that person looks like a real thing of what they are. So <laughs> that's that's like the most attractive. Oh, wow. Well, I got to read that. I haven't read that, but it's um, fun. And isn't that kind of annoying how we have to say that about books now? Like when you're talking about Ready Player One or Dan Brown, Da Vinci Codes, like you can never say, oh, I enjoyed it. You have to be like, well, it's not the best prose. And I realized going into it, it's like a fun junk food. Re- you have to like, or maybe that's just me. You have to preface is, it. No, Holmes, uh, Pete talks about that. He pops pop ups. Like, you know what I mean? Like he would talk about how at any time he has to like, you know, make sure like a disclaimer about anything that he does that he feels like could be misinterpreted. And you're like, yeah, we all have those. We're just getting that little pop up saying, oh, you better explain to them. You, you don't actually. Yeah, mean this, blah, blah, blah. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Have you been on there? Was that? Oh, on no. Pete Holmes? God, I would die no? to. He was one of the first podcasts I ever got into, um, like right around the time that I, I went through a divorce, like maybe like six years ago now, seven years ago. Oh, that's good that you can't peg it to the year. There's people I know that are like, when my ex and I broke up six years, two months and three (laughs) days ago, and like their phone is, I'm not even doing a bit, like their phone, that's still their picture on it. Oh my God. Yeah, there's some people that cling. Yeah, no, absolutely. And oh man, I I just have so much um, empathy for those people. I mean, but at the same time. But it's a good split? Yeah. Good terms? Oh no, no. no. Well, Yes and no. Started out good, got bad, got fine. Yeah, that's <laughs> how it goes, I mean? though. Yeah, no. There's, totally. there's. I feel like there's forces that bring us together with the person we're with, and there's forces that. Oh yeah. That pull us apart. If there's someone you're supposed to be with, like it, it just happens. Like you wake up one day and you're like, oh, I'm in a serious relationship with this person because that's how it was yeah. supposed to go. And then you reflect on a person who's no longer in your life, and like, mm-hmm. when did that? go to end to oh yeah it had to that was yeah. in the next chapter but pete holmes was the first podcast you listened um, to after the divorce? well it was one of them um marin was the first one i ever got into and it was it was before um wasn't it, enough for you yeah, yeah. no wasn't enough <laughs> oh we're doing this um yeah like he like marin i was immediately drawn to him because i got obsessed with like mark duplass and his, and his brother and just their their movies and their whole vibe like many years ago and um, I just like was like, does he have any podcasts? Is he on anything? And um, 
I found Duplass was like a pretty early guest. Um, like one on, of the first 20 or yeah, something, right? Yeah. And uh, so I, lo- and I loved, they, they had this great interview and then just the format that was when podcasts really like crept into like, oh fuck, like this is, this is like radio, but like so much better yeah. and crazy, you know, like it became exactly what you said the other day, which I thought was so fucking great. You said, uh, thank you. Go yeah. on. <laughs> I love that shit. Um, yeah, no, but like you were talking about how we can like at any given mo- moment in our life where we're feeling a certain way and we need a little bit of guidance, we can just have this brilliant teacher in in our fucking head and tell us like, Oh yeah, this was my experience. This is what I think. This is what I did. And you're like, Fuck yeah, I'm gonna get through this painting. Fuck yeah, I'm gonna get through this song or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, you know? for paintings, like listen to Alex Gray. He will make you feel like any moment not spent in cosmic creativity is wasted. And exactly. that's a real, that's a real guy. That is not a snake oil salesman. He no, go, he goes that. there and brings back those, like you you lose your if you've never seen his stuff before and you see it, it like you take a step back and oh yeah reevaluate what you've been thinking. That was the first uh art show that we ever went to as a band, that Circa ever went to as a band. Um when the first at at uh Cosm? Um no, I've been the I was at the original Cosm before, but this was actually he was having a show. It just lined up perfectly. This was so strange. We we were recording uh, Blue Sky Noise, like our, our major label record, and we were going to Toronto, and we went there to work with David Bottrell, who had worked with Tool, who we loved Tool, and we loved, like, and he worked with King Crimson and all these other, like, weird, proggy, like, cool. nut jobs, you know? And we were just like, yeah, this guy. And, uh, yeah, that was like, you know, when the major label was like, we can pair you up with any producer in the world, anyone you could ever dream of, uh, and we're like, this guy <laughs> and they're like are you sure <laughs> you know what i mean like why why that because uh too esoteric or too expensive like or why, why they would think that yeah. um their hesitancy was just more so that they know that david is not someone who is no matter how bad you want to hit he's not going to force it out of a band that doesn't want to write it you know what i mean yeah. and he's about and he is about the album and he is about like art and he is about like exploring and he doesn't care about selling he's gonna take your money he's gonna take the label's money and you know i i would argue that any producer who um takes the money from like the major label like all they're doing is just buying themselves time to then work with smaller bands that don't have a big budget but give them more attention so like there's this ecosystem that's happening you know um yeah and he's just one of those people he's a pure like he's very he just is not a sellout he's the complete opposite of a sellout and even though he's a grammy award-winning producer he just has this great attitude and um sorry i get like crazy cotton mouth sometimes oh no that's real podcast content yeah. right there yeah drinking some water like it on pause. my jeans and that's when i realized <laughs> <laughs> that I'd forgotten to buy butter at the store. <laughs> Dramatic pause. Oh, dude, I love it. Um, yeah. Like, so you got him, and just for that record, which, by the way, I love yeah. that you guys use the same the same painter for all the covers. So it's that's like who I was hanging out with last night. Oh, awesome! So you bring the uh, yeah. So then it's a whole world that mm-hmm. way. Like that's what it looks like. It's like Funkadelic would have that. It was all uh, what Pedro Bell would do those really trippy album covers for. Totally. For them. So now you have that aesthetic and it looks really cool, like on its own, just as a regular painting. The album covers are Absolutely. so pretty. He's such a brilliant artist. And yeah, like it wasn't even like a totally on purpose thing, like from the get go. It just was like at a certain point by the second record, it was just obvious that it, it is w- what it should be. And um, but yeah, we always loved like the Stanley Donwood Radiohead connection. And we just really liked any band that would stick with an artistic um, partner in that way. It just seems so cool and magical and like, oh, wow. Like, it's just another, it's just another example of companionship and commitment and this beautiful thing that you can have if you really do dig in and just, and like trust somebody and really give everything to the idea of collaboration. And, you know, there's no reason to stop working with ESL for us because he, he understands us. We understand him. We've had this similar um, career arc 
to each other. Uh, a double-sided synchronicity brought us together, something by chance for him and something by chance for us. And we just find that our connection with him is so... Um, yeah, for lack of a better word, magical. That's so, awesome. Yeah. yeah, we can't use that word. We have to like look at yeah. the floor and be like, Mad- magical. It's not, <laughs> like, yeah. I think people's yeah. problem with magic is they think it means going from A to Z or without going through A, B, C, D, and there's no logical connection. But mm-hmm. there, it's just a connection we don't see. It's, it's still very materialist physics Describable, repeatable, mm-hmm. but we just don't have it yet. Mm-hmm. We don't have the tools to describe it. I feel like there was some pin I was talking with Pete Holmes about, or maybe we got past that. Part. Oh, divorce. Uh, let's do, yeah, podcasts. Uh, what was the what was the trail that led us to podcasts? Imp. Imp of the perverse. <laughs> no, that might be too old. Mm. It's sand. It's sand. It's slipping. Through I should my be fingers. on there in a month. I was actually supposed to Are do you? it like two months ago, and then he canceled like that morning. Oh, I was so man. bummed about it because I was. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't have depended on this, but I was like, "Oh, cool! I'll be on like Pete Holmes, and then like that'll that'll get me this push to help me with this thing that I'm trying to uh, to put out at happen. this." But I don't know if he was going through a thing, and they had to tape that crashing show, so he had to stop. And they had they have saved up episodes for a while, but I was like, "No!" And then I've heard him mention you. Oh, on really? The show. Oh, awesome! Oh, I think it might have been the Shane one of the Shane episodes where yeah, he likes my posts sometimes, so I think I'm I'm good. I think I'm I'll still be on You're there, in. but yeah, yeah. yeah. And I just I love I want to be guests on things that I like yeah because then you can oh fuck yeah dude of you course. know the you know the whole thing then oh yeah I know the thing of course uh, that was you know I feel like I had a similar kind of like uh, realization a few months back where I was just like it it was ironic because I heard you on another podcast talk about Leary and and talk about like just the idea of finding the others and you know I just had that realization not that long ago that like, dude, I've just been like barking up the wrong tree for a long time. I've been, you know, the You're art- finding not the others, just like yes. the people opposite of you nonstop. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> a lot of people who just maybe just don't really get me or kind of see me as something that I'm not. And, um, I don't know. What are you not? Yeah. Such a good question. Um, or well, what are you not merely? Well, cause I, if they're like, you're guitar player and that's all you are and that's all you'll ever be it's like well you are that but you're also these other things yeah i think like you know say for instance just in the art world right and like the design world that i i represent i represent the idea of like um you know uh, an athlete like diddling around in a sport that you know his second sport michael jordan playing baseball bo jackson whatever Yeah. yeah exactly and and I represent that, and I feel like they're all kind of like, okay, yeah, like you put time in, but like you're not one of us, but it's cool. Like, yeah, you can hang out here, and we'll kind of like show you what it's like. But you know, you kind of are. I just have always felt like an outsider, and it's probably because I am. You know, yeah. like I'm not traditionally trained. Like I'm self-taught. Like I, I did. I do have a another creative career that came before painting, and and I did. I was allowed the time to find painting because of that career. And but you also talk about your mom while not being an artist, like introducing you to oil, uh, like yeah. oil paints or oil pastels and, and stuff. So it feels like you've always been toying around in that. You just didn't make your full career out of it. But, totally. But nowadays it's it's game on now. Like you can be a hundred things. Like it's not a weird thing yeah. to pursue different. I think that's what this podcast is becoming about. I like talking to people that have their hands in lots of different things and are are struggling with that internally of, of that identity and basically having permission to pursue multiple mm, yeah. um, mediums because the medium isn't the thing. That's just your footprint that you leave behind and then it expires. Like, no, who knows how any of the stuff we make is actually going to hold up. There could be a technology that makes, you yeah, know, whether it's music it <laughs> where it taps into like, no, it's going to make the perfect music as it goes along. So it's consistently novel and all that other stuff isn't going to last anymore. Same with visual stuff. And uh, do you ever think about how we're just we're, we're having to release, not having to, but just are releasing more and more content as mm-hmm. time goes on? And is there a cap to this or will it eventually be like you just are your your painting is you, your world is mm-hmm. you. And just by being you're radiating that 
constantly without having to, oh, no, this goes here, adjust this. Like, yeah. the way you have to edit films before, it's, like, way quicker now. Totally. I think that's so... Yeah, like, um, I feel very in touch with that idea and very in touch with, um, you know, being as an, an artistic act and um, how, yeah, like... Like for me, I can even apply it like in a microcosm kind of way with Circa and see how we've changed our way of creating over the years based on just um, situations and budgets and whatever. And now it's like, yeah, we can just be in flow together. That's so cool. Yeah. And that is a that's a profound thing to feel and experience. And um, when you realize that that's possible with a group of people you then you don't you don't have to toil for years and years and and have this like we must make a masterpiece blah 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 blah. it's like no we must be (laughs) and we must capture it and then release it and then do it again yeah and that's the act of being circa for us is like it's not about each record each record's a snapshot and any person that hears our songs before they see us live that's just the invitation. You know, it's like, hey, come. Like, Yeah, I like that you said on the on the third eye drops that uh, we, we make the record every night. Yeah. Like, not saying that you make a whole new slew of songs every night on stage, but the way you're playing it that night differs from the night yeah. before. Do you tape all your live sets? Um, we do sometimes. Like, we, we've had tours where Nick has a rig basically plugged right into our in-ears and we're getting all of it um, just to have the tracks. Do you um, ever do anything like release it, sell it, live records? We did a thing where anyone that had a VIP thing for our, our shows where uh, we basically compiled uh, an entire set for them by the end of like, oh, this was the best we did this song, this was the best we did this song. Oh, that's and then, cool. And then we just sent it to them. We were just like, oh, here's an MP. Here's Seems like, like you have a good relationship with the fans and that yeah. they're like really cool people. Oh, uh, they're awesome. And we're so lucky and like... Yeah, like, like. Do you get recognized often? Oh no, no. Like, not uh, even like amongst those circles. Like, if you're going to another show, like, are you like, are you? Oh, that definitely happens. Like when you're in that world. Yeah, that happened the other night when I went to see Minus the Bear a few times actually. Minus the Bear. Yeah, they're a great band. I'll, I need I'll... to get. I used to go to so many shows, and so I used to be on the band path, mm-hmm. and then I left it for stand up comedy because it's like, wait, I don't have to be with other people and. Mm-hmm. I don't have to bring gear around and oh, I'm encouraged yeah. to make stuff up on the spot. It's actually way more encouraged to do that than repeat yourself. It just, I was so tired of, cause I started in orchestra. I was a violin player and then playing orchestra. I was always part of big groups. And so the giant group of hundreds of people became a four piece thing and then a three piece thing. And then eventually leading to me just being my own solo thing. And then yeah. that reached its cap of like, oh, I'm way too isolated now. Like I yeah. need I need people and to collaborate and uh, stuff like that. There was some point to all that. I don't know, but you're so good at like, you're keeping me going and I'm like not getting to ask you questions. So I want to ask about like, how did you find the bass in them? Like Flea, Flea made me like the bass a lot. I was a big Chili Peppers fan. I still like them, but they're, um, no, no, but there, I still, I still like them. I, I'm not yeah. going to put any, but... Yeah, but yeah. then, but he was the first uh, thing that I noticed that I guess I'd seen Seinfeld and I'd seen slap bass and stuff like that. But something <laughs> about specifically the way he played his fusing of punk rock and he played in fear before that with totally with and loving, uh, you know, Jaco Pastorius and Larry Graham and Bootsy and combining all that, mm-hmm. which I didn't know any of those people before, but right. he introduced me. To yeah. them, and um, yeah, like, I feel like John Frusciante got me into Hendrix more than Hendrix. Just you know, we hear you know Purple Haze and Fire and Wind Cries Mary and stuff on the radio sometimes. That's all good, but when you get into the live recordings where oh, it's yeah. riddled with mistakes and he changes it as he goes along, never plays oh, yeah. it the same way twice. It's it does something to your brain. It unlocks like you feel a part of it that didn't exist before. It doesn't do it to everyone. Like oh. Some some of the stuff I'll show my girlfriend and she'll be like, no, I mean it's just it's just noodling to me. It doesn't do anything to right. me. I'm like, really? Oh man, it does so much for me. But yeah. then other stuff, it does it does hit her there. It's like I love that guitar part that does that, but she doesn't care about guitar or things like that. Sure. Another thing is she doesn't. We we have this conversation a lot. She doesn't seek out proof of the world being magical. It's almost Ooh. like she is. Uh, 
she feels it intuitively and doesn't need the proof the way my my logic oh. mind needs it. So that's why I'm watching all these holofractal things. So then it's like, no, I have the physics proving it's a magical world, whereas she doesn't need that to be happy and and magical, I guess. Yeah, my partner is similar, and she she is very intuitive, and she is very in touch with nature. She's very in touch with just magic in in general she almost like it's kind of odd i'm always like yeah i don't see her like toiling with the rubik's cube you know what i mean she's just like yeah it is you yeah know what I mean? and you're like but don't you but don't you see this thing and she's like uh-huh yeah i i wonder sometimes if it's not to not to make it about gender but there are there is such thing as gender and mm-hmm. and men do tend to think more in bounded closed systems and women tend to think more in terms of infinity and like sure. that's why they're better at multitasking you know they're holding the baby with one hand and like you know doing this over here and you uh-huh. know everything's all right i got it and then yeah. men focused like sitting in the hunting like with the spear waiting stoically it's all in that <laughs> sapiens book, like you know how we're. That's why men aren't as talkative because there's less value in speech sure. evolutionarily. Because like you got to be quiet when you're hunting stuff, and then with women, there's more value in communicating, like for gathering stuff, getting the berries. It's like located past that one bush with the the weird <laughs> stick sticking out of it, like so that they. That's why they're better communicators and speakers and stuff evolutionary, and it's all blending together now. So it's not like yeah. men are funnier and blah blah blah. It's it's all yeah. It's all merging into one thing. There's not a man or woman anymore. It's no. merging into the one big soup, yeah. which we can pick our avatar or whatever afterwards. Yeah, and I love. Well, I mean, I just love that. Yeah, the idea of like the feminine for you know, eons has been all of that. And I think there's obviously, yeah, there's totally uh, proof of that in, in the people we experience on a daily basis. But I love that we're going into this strange era where everything is becoming just one thing. And it all feels like, oh, we are just becoming that idea, that idea of we are all one thing. We are all like God. We all are this thing. Yeah, we're uh, going to wake up to it. And I don't think it's going to be like a veil is lifted. I think it's going to be like, you know, when you look at that picture of the old lady and then you see the young woman there, it's like mm-hmm. it's the same photo. Yeah, I think that's how we're going to awaken to it. It's like it was there the whole time and mm-hmm. we just realize and then we can see both like with a magic eye or something. It was always there. It's not a big shift it's you wake up to it it's literally it was always there like the word the word enlightenment means to remember that you're made of light not that oh i'm light now and you're dark it's no you remember that you already are that thing that word um which i know is just like a mouth sound that we're associating with a thing but um yeah to remember just gives me kind of chills like the more i like i just had this completely different notion of it now because I do even right now feel like the past six months or so I've been going through this remembering of who I am in a lot of ways. And, and like in a literal sense of like remembering my younger self and the first lessons I was learning in psych- with psychedelics and, and, and just with like strange experiences. And, um, but then you go through this period of time where you like need to quiet that down and you're trying to like, you know, just deal with like, getting approved to buy a house or some shit or like whatever. Oh, that's the like, worst. Yeah. Just but I mean, good stuff. problem to have. Yeah. But sitting there and signing that phone book of things yeah. that were just trying to figure it like out. Like going into debt, but that's how you get a house because otherwise, how do you get the house? Yeah, you got to be. You're buying your house rich. in Portland? Uh, we bought a house. So we Hell actually, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Never thought that was going to be I've never a clapped thing. on this podcast. <laughs> Um, with your partner, marriage? Or, yeah. or uh, you were getting, or? We're getting married in August. Cool. Uh, yeah. but uh, I need well, to start using partner. I'm, I've spent so much time in Texas that, mm-hmm. like, you know, you get your ass kicked saying something like partner. Of course. So yeah. it's like, but then when I'm here around my super California friends, when I, sound, when I say girlfriend, it's like, oh, you're going to go to the soda shop later right. and <laughs> go sit in a convertible and make out creek? And yeah, yeah maybe, totally. but... That's not all we do. Yeah, <laughs> that's not all we do. I love it. Uh, yeah, Go to the no. sock hop and shake our hips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I don't know for whatever reason. A few years back, um, when I first met Sarah, as we, I felt the need. I couldn't call her a girlfriend because I was like, listen, like 
I met this person and with two months of knowing her and having a long distance relationship with her, like I had already committed to like moving across the country to be with her. So she's not my girlfriend. She's my partner. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I was starting to feel that like, because after you get divorced and then you meet someone again, you have, you go through this thing where people are like, Oh boy, here we go. You know, like, like he's going back on the thing and you're just like, okay, well I'll just have to prove it to you that it's not that, you know yeah. what I mean? And I actually, you, you eventually realize you never had to prove anything. You know what I mean? That's, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, that's a big lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's more a, than with psychedelics, more than any visual thing or synchronicity or anything, the, mm -hmm. the feeling that it's all you putting yourself in that prison and you could have walked out of it Ooh, and boy. you always can. And it's not like a long walk out. It's literally sidestepping out. Um, have you read the music lesson by any chance? I've had it for years and I haven't read it yet. Oh, but you I gotta know read I that need, ass. I know I need to. So there's a line in there where, so you know that there are, um, there's twelve notes. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it's like with colors, like there's infinite colors. But really, the mm -hmm. way we use notes and there's frets set up and everything, there's twelve notes. Mm -hmm. And in any key signature, there are seven correct notes. And there's five, let's say, incorrect notes in any like actual key signature. And then when uh, if you ever hit a wrong key, like on the piano, then if you go one to your right or one to your left, you're back in the right note. So you're never more than a half step away from being back in tune. So we see music as this really complicated thing, mm -hmm. but it's super easy. If you guess, you're more likely to hit it right than yeah. wrong. And if you hit it wrong and you just are confident with that wrong note and then go back one and repeat. That's how you improvise. And it's that simple. And then when I learned that, I'm like, why didn't anybody tell me that in all those yeah. years of violin lessons? Why was it all this memorizing of these symbols and playing it like that? And you didn't give me those fundamentals. Jesus. Yeah, that's so, yeah, that's profound. I mean, another um, thing he says in there is, uh, never, never lose the groove to find the note. I heard it's you say this on like another podcast too. and I love that. I love, I, uh, the 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 ripple effect of that phrase and how many ways it's applicable in life is just absurd. Like, yeah, it's endless. You can just apply that to so many situations. And um, but yeah, in music, that is one of the more profound truths. Again, a simple one, but one that so many people don't understand and 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 kind of you know have to learn that lesson over and over again without ever learning it. Yeah. I was going to ask you earlier. Um, oh, yeah. Two questions. Let's see. Which one comes first? You're a drummer. Where do good drummers come from? Uh, well, I, I would not consider myself a good one. So, But where does um, a drummer come from? Because it's, uh, it's <laughs> in order to play drums, you need such specific circumstances. And mm -hmm. it's not something you can plug. I guess you can get those electronic ones now. But kids that actually have a drum set and Yo, practice right. it and stuff, like you, you have to really want to do that. It's So it's almost like... Yeah, it's got to come from some opportunity, um, whether it's your parents are just cool and they're like, yeah, sure, be a drummer, have a drum kit, make noise, like annoy the fuck out of me forever. Or, um, you know, they just are like in band from fourth grade on and they're always staying after school and they're in the fucking, you know. The, you were in the, band, right? Yeah. You like snare yeah. drum or what? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Snare drum and marching. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were that. you ever a drum major or, um, or section leader or anything like that? Were no, you? I never really, you know, um, I was getting towards the point where, you know, I was in like special orchestra and I was like starting to go down that path. But for whatever reason, I was just like, uh, it's just so consuming. Like yeah. I, I noticed even then being really young, how anyone who was going that way and doing all the things and being like, you know, the section leaders and the, the, the majors and all that stuff, you're like, wow, that's all they do. Like, that's really like, and I looked them up, some of them, and some of them literally are teaching music in that school. Oh, that they that's were doing funny. That. So it's just like this, wow, this. I think you, beating. not that it's a competition, but it is a competition <laughs> sometimes, but I think you beat them like uh, in, the, in the very like <laughs> egotistical lens of looking at things. Yeah. Like, I think you've got a way cooler situation <laughs> than teaching like, the songs that they didn't write or even worse songs they wrote. Oh to, boy. <laughs> to well, I just on. think about that all the time. And like, not that like there's not that there's anything wrong with that, but like, I'm just kind of like, Holy shit. Like they, like they were defined by the music program 
in that school system from the time they joined it in like middle school all the way till when they graduated then they went to, to college specifically with the dream in mind of going back to that system and then being the one to teach people and get those people through that system and i was just like fucking hats off to you man like yeah, you gotta I break the cycle yeah um, that's not me like i gotta go i gotta go uh Explore. Yeah, you had too much punk rock in you. I like when you described on that other podcast, not the third eye drops, but when you and um forget which bandmates it were specifically, but how you guys would look at each other from across the gym or something and be like, Who's that guy? What's his what's his deal? It's like yeah. you're wearing similar band shirts and I forget what the one band was that that made you be like, Oh, you've heard of them, no one's heard of them and then you became we have to be friends now. He's wearing yeah. the shirt and you found your tribe that yeah. way. And now we're doing it in a different way, I guess through Instagram or something, because we're not wearing shirts totally. on the instru- internet. But we're, yeah, we're finding each other on... I've met, like, I've met so many cool people because of Instagram. It's really, it's, it's it's really funny. It really is. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, I think about it all the time now. But I was, I was talking to, to Sarah the other day about it, and I was just saying how, Jesus, like, I'm... I actually feel like when I had that conversation with Michael Phillip the other day with, with third eye drops, you know, we had a similar thing where I was texting with him and I, I Instagrammed him and it was just so obvious. I, I thought it, I actually had like this moment where I, when I listened to the podcast, you I went was, back and listened to the yeah, episode. I, yeah, I did. Uh, cause I just wanted to hear him. Like, do I sound like a fucking idiot telling me like my, because I haven't opened up about these things in a while. And the synchronicities, the yeah. magic, the craziness. Yeah, and just the psychedelic stuff. And, and so I listened to it and to I hear think you got to lean into it. Yeah. I think that makes you like a more full version of you and people will love you even more. It's the people definitely, that do. it's authentically me. And I'm starting to realize that more and more every day. Like, oh, I just have to be me. Uh, I have to be Gary. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I, but yeah, I listened to it and I heard the beginning where he basically said, like he did this intro saying that he felt like we were kindred and I felt that same exact thing. And it made me feel really good to hear that, you know, we shared that. And I'm like, yeah, I was just telling Sarah, like, it's so weird. I feel like I'm like actually making friends through doing this. And um, I've definitely, I've made some friends before with podcasts. Um, I, I love Mark from Adventures in Design, but other than that, I don't know that one. Oh, I'll check that oh, out. Oh, yeah, you would love that. You would be a fucking amazing guest on there, by the way. Um, amazing design. Uh, or Adventures, Adventures in design. design. Yeah, get me on there. Yeah. Or, I have I have, I'm, I have clout. <laughs> I have that that four or 5,000 Instagram. It's actually K. They took the K off of it. <laughs> or I don't know. I don't know how much anything I need to be on, on stuff. Sometimes they just like you and then you're good. Totally, but, dude. But sometimes I worry that... Like, I'll reach out to people, and I don't know if they're busy, but I'm wondering if, like, oh, I don't look like a big enough entity for them. Sure. And then maybe one day I'll look like a big enough entity. But if they don't want to come on, they don't want to come on. Yeah. They're probably just too busy, though. I mean, Anthony Bourdain just hung himself. Like, we don't know what's... I don't know what's going on with anybody. I I can't actually say what the mental state of anyone is. If they're like, no, they're doing great. They're they're happy. Last time I talked to them, really, I don't know. But I'll say, based on evidence, it's probably fine. But... And with like a with a rope from the bath rope, like the the tying belt from a bath rope on the door handle. Yeah, man, did you go down that conspiracy rabbit hole at all? I did for a little bit, and then eventually it's just I'm just trying to make sense out of this sadness, mm-hmm. and I don't know what he knew or didn't know, or what the situation with his girlfriend was, or right. what anything was. But did you read David Cho's open letter towards him? Uh, I started reading it and then I stopped because it was like really fucking me up and it was early in the morning and I just was like, I can't deal with this yet. And I haven't gone back, but now it's been brought up three times to me. So yeah, I you're meant like to I, read it. I, really have I think to. it's because it's just such an honest, like he's because he says like, I love you and miss you and also fuck you because that's David Cho. He's of like course. the super like balled up energy Korean guy. It's like, just gotta, I just gotta fuck everything and tell you fuck you. It's just who I am. I gotta draw guns and tits and I was doing that before I was a billionaire. So fuck you. Here's five grand. <laughs> You're That'd be good to have on here too. Yeah, he'd be awesome. Who's? Do you want to do a podcast? I do. Uh, there's been there's been a thing in me for a long time that has felt like I I should. I've had certain conversations that I was just like, "Fuck, dude! If if that was recorded, that would have would have been a perfect uh, episode." Um, but like most things, I'm kind of like, "All right, I, I have my list of things that I'm working on right now, and I'm gonna just that's gonna happen because." 
it's already gotten so much easier to make them than it than my first inclination to make one. Like now it's like, whoa, it's like exponentially easier to do a podcast than I ever could have imagined. So Yeah, you'd be good at it. Yeah. And I feel thanks. like it uh I like what it's done for me and it, it makes you realize you can fall into patterns. Like when I was guests on other people's thing, I would have my rap and my things that I could reference. And then when I'm doing my own, I'm like, oh man, I already said that. I already yeah. said that six times. Better come up with some new shit. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, it helps you with other aspects of, of life too. Yeah. Just, and when, when else do you force yourself to have an hour, two hour, three hour conversation with someone? No breaks, no pauses, right. no, I'm going to go get us something to drink. Do you want anything? I'm going to go use the bathroom. Maybe there's some of that. But, yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, it's, it's, uh, you, you go to places that you wouldn't otherwise go. Yeah. And there's almost more, there, there's more, um, it brings out wanting to be honest more. Mm-hmm. I don't know why that is. You want to like you want to be honest to more people than when you just be private. It's, yeah, it's a strange muscle. But it feels like it's giving you um, a platform. I mean, it literally is giving you a platform to be honest and kind of say something in a way that maybe could be more meaningful to you. Um, so, you know, if there's something painful that you're wrestling with, or just some kind of thing that's been keeping you up at night for whatever reason, it feels like you're giving it more weight when you say it on the podcast and almost like you're also setting it free in a way you're kind of like, Oh yeah. Like it's like, it's like a diary in that way. It's like a uh, sketchbook or uh, whatever, like making a demo. You're just getting this, uh, you're getting this idea out to then make room for something new. And, um, and it emotionally is really satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. I love that shit. Me too. Yeah. I was thinking about, um, I don't know if this ties into it. Or actually, first, going back to this other question, you said you don't consider yourself a good drummer. No. Do you consider yourself a good guitar player? No. You don't consider yourself, do you consider yourself a good at being you, like good mm-hmm. at expressing the sounds in your head? You yeah. know how to get those out. Yeah. So it sounds like you never, because I'm, I'm, I like virtuosos a lot. Not all the way, like my dial goes to maybe seven Mm -hmm. on wanting to be virtuoso. I'm not one of those people that's like, look at John Petrucci of Dream Theater in this 25 minute solo. I think that's completely masturbatory. (laughs) Sorry, John Petrucci. It's probably great. I haven't heard it. I don't mean to call you out specifically. That was just the reference I grabbed out of the air. You're you're godlike. And same with Steve Vai and all those. But but I like I like song construction more. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you like song. You you care more about making the song rather than like look what I can do yeah well i think just in general and again this goes back to psychedelics and and weird um thinking but i think i've always been the guy that's like i can't get over the fact that like a guitar is what it is i'm like oh it's like this piece of wood where like these fucking weird things like 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 someone took so much time to figure out how to make this and make it make the sound that yeah. it does. Have and you watched the the Paul Reed Smith TED Talk? Oh yeah, yeah, where he talks about like I have a lot of questions. What's the wood made up? What's the finish made up? What's yeah. the what's the pickups? What's the did you what do you use the tuning pegs? What metal is it made of? Like he thinks about every physical aspect that goes into that instrument yeah. in order to make it not subtract the sound because it's not supposed to the guitar is never adding anything to it you're just trying to make it so that none of the sound uh, mm-hmm. gets caught in it like and you're never going to have a perfectly energy transfer machine like you'll get like 99 percent of the energy back that you put into it but you'll never get 100 percent of the energy that you put back into it exactly and that's the kind of shit going through my brain sometimes when I think, you know, I'm playing guitar and I love that, but I'm just, I've never been a person to sit there and fixate on one skill and just take it to the limit. Like that's just not the way I roll. It's like, I, I want to learn just enough to be able to express an idea through the thing. And that's like all I need. You know what I mean? I don't know why, but that's just always been the way I am. And, um, I have an obsessive compulsive side where I'll just get really into a, a subject and just devour it for like a little bit, but not with skills. Like I love, I love knowledge. I can just soak it up. But when it comes to guitar playing or drumming or painting, drawing, like anything that I'm into, it's like all I want, all I want is to be able to utilize it in a way to express my soul's innermost thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the whole, the whole Gary Shanley thing, you know, it's like, that's all I want. I just want, I want to use it as a voice. And, um, to be honest, I, I find 
comfort and the idea of inspiring others. And I find like, I find that to be my purpose. Like I, I want to say to other people like, dude, I'm not special. Like you want to be creative. You want to express something, pick something up and just watch some YouTube videos or just play it until it makes enough noise for you and you feel good about it. And like, just do it. Like, yeah, the like, fact that they have YouTube videos to watch, that's just such a cool... Did you ever used to download, like, on FTP servers? I would I would look up, like, instructional bass videos and things like that. I was talking to a friend who... Uh, he's a drummer, and he was talking about... We were talking about John Blackwell, Prince's drummer, who died, like, what, a year ago or something? Mm-hmm. One of the drummers. I mean, he had a bunch of drummers, but one yeah. of the really good... Once and he was like, "Yeah, that was one of the first VHSs I owned of drumming pre Gospel Chops." I'm like, "What's Gospel Chops?" He's like, "Oh, you don't know Gospel Chops? Gospel Chops is pre YouTube, where like it would be drummers like showing their like gospel players just showing their like craziest shit on there, and drummers would just flock to this website to mm-hmm. watch those those videos. And then YouTube took over that, and now Instagram has took over that with Drums Daily or Inspire Bass or you can just see like really impressive licks from five year olds, fifty year olds, twenty four year olds. Like this whole, yeah, this yeah. whole notion of like, oh, that's the main guy that can play the instrument. Like, nope, sorry, there's five year olds that can play <laughs> perfect renditions of Voodoo Child, and yeah, that's yeah. how it is now. So you might as well just try to be a you. You're you're not yeah. gonna win the the most technical best game. A right. robot's gonna win that yeah, eventually. Of the five year old won't beat a robot. Yeah, robot it, doesn't get tired. And it's again, it's like the whole analogy thing just always comes back. Like where does that get you once you get there what, like once you decide oh yeah i've gotten i've mastered this thing you know it's the same concept of like wanting all the things and you just eventually hit this place where you're like it's not doing anything it's not filling the void it's not like what what is it and it's because it's not about that yeah, <laughs> yeah it never I mean? was yeah and like i think about this a lot when it comes to yeah just like possessions and um you know success and all this stuff and just you know the one thing that always saved me was like was nirvana and watching the the what is it it's like nirvana live sold out documentary thing like that was put out many many years ago i had it on vhs and i watched it like all the time i still haven't seen it and i love nirvana especially live nirvana dude you will love this so it's like live songs but then there's like these intercut like interviews with them uh with you know foreign interviews and whatever all over the place and it's strung together in this really kind of like interesting way but there's this beautiful moment that just fucking stuck with me forever and they're just out on this balcony and you know Cobain's just sitting there smoking a cigarette and they ask him about success like do you feel like you've really made it like this was like peak nirvana they're fucking filthy rich and all this stuff and he was just like well you know, I, I used to, I used to love thrift stores and I used to go into thrift stores. And when I'd go into thrift stores, I'd feel so excited because I'd go in there with $5 and I knew I could like go searching and find a treasure and walk out and I'd have my treasure. He's like, now I can buy the whole store and it's all garbage to me, (laughs) (laughs) you know? And I was just like, wow, like that really did something for me. That really freed me in a way that was like, yeah, it's all going to be garbage once once I can afford it. So I might as well stay in this place where it all feels like a treasure. Yeah. And, you know? So I don't know. That that was like a gift. And I feel like I've tried to kind of like stay on that as much as possible, even though I'll get distracted and be like, oh, I got to have this. I got to have that. I got, you know, got to make this nice, blah, 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 blah. But then, you know, you're just like, dude, the clock's ticking. What are you spending your time on? Yeah, it's so easy to fall back into that pattern. Mm -hmm. Just every day, every day is the battle to try to pull yourself out of that pattern. And oh yeah, that's why I love your art. Yeah, that's why I love. Oh, thank you. You know, every day when I see what you're wrestling with and what you're making, and just whatever is floating around in your brain, and you're trying to say something, and a lot of it is that hey, this is what it is. Like you know, yeah. it's all the now it's the it's the making the thing and then putting out the thing and then knowing you got to make another thing and that's what makes it ex- exciting you know what I yeah mean? the thing is the footprint too yeah. it's never the actual thing were you talking about that like where where did i hear that where 
Oh yeah, yeah. I feel like maybe Michael from Third Eye Drops might have said that or something. But how like, the art itself is not the thing. Actually, it might have been on the Very Ape podcast. You know the Very Ape podcast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, have you been on there? What? No, but I listened to you on it. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, oh yeah. cool. And hey, that was the hey, amazing. Hey Sean and Cass, you should have Colin on if you guys want. But hey guys, they're cool. You still fuck. listen to this? Maybe. Hey, <laughs> hey, and Mara too. But you guys dethruppled or something, so I don't address you as one group, but. All still three, very cool. Oh, the thruple. Yeah, they were they were a thruple, mm-hmm. and they dethrupled recently, and there's not a, a information about it. And um, I pry when I'm when I'm near people, like mm-hmm. I'll like, oh, why did you dethruple? What happened? Like yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm extracting all the information <laughs> and stuff, but I don't feel comfortable doing it in a message, like because I don't know what state they're they're in or how yeah, sad or devastated or anything. Course. But but deep inside, I'm like. I want to. I want to know how you guys got together and how how the star formed and how the star supernova mm. to wherever. I'm I'm a little observer guy, like over here on Earth with my telescope. Like, what did what happened? Like, yeah. not in a judgment or anything way. It's just just curious because that's so great. That I mean, I actually I totally understand where you're coming from and what you're saying. But at the same time, for people who go through divorce, there's this thing where they talk about how like they're like my divorce is not about you. And they're basically, they go through this thing where, um, you know, like, especially guys, like if you're going through a divorce, the guy will be like, so like, what happened, man? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, when when did you kind of know? Did you have any signs? You know what I mean? They're trying to figure out like, is it going to happen to me? You know what I mean? And, uh, but yeah, I'm the same way. I Like, it fascinates me. And when people are open about it, it's actually like really exciting to me to hear just how people's relationships work and, you know, because you just really never get a clear picture of it otherwise because, you know, all of us are posturing in one way or the other. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And we can't help it because otherwise, I don't know, we'd have photos of us going to the bathroom or something. You can't have full, full transparency. Or maybe one day you will. And I was just going to say, or we'd all be Frank Zappa. And then <laughs> I immediately just pictured him on the toilet <laughs> and that, that, that poster. Like, Ooh, that's <laughs> another synchronicity. Let's talk about that. You were saying that... You were listening to a podcast I was on, mm-hmm. and you had a nephew or something, was it, that was sending you a, a drawing? Oh, no, my friend. Okay. You're Your talking, friend's you're talking kid. talking about the synchronicity? Yeah. Okay, no, it was, okay, so it was basically uh, a friend of mine, Fred, he he was one of the people that ran Slow Culture Gallery in LA uh, for many years, and they did a show with this guy, Joe Roberts, and uh, he... Uh, He's like this really, he's this great visionary artist guy. And he, he was featured on um, Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia on Vice. I don't know if you've seen that show, but it's fucking fantastic. I think and I've seen, I've, I haven't seen an episode, but I think I've seen it like in yeah. the box forum on the TV. Oh, dude, you should check it out. It's great. Um, but so he, on the DMT um, episode, they featured Joe Roberts for a second. And like, they're like, so how many times have you done TV? He's like, I don't know. I've done it a bunch. And like, I go in and I take it back what I can and I make these paintings and he, and these drawings. And he, a lot of his drawings have like Ninja Turtle guys or they have like uh, Mickey Mouse, but like not Mickey Mouse. And it's some weird, you know, kind of parallel dimension version of Mickey Mouse. And, um, but so he makes a lot of drawings with Ninja Turtles. And yeah, the other day, I had randomly contacted Fred when I was like on this trip, just being like, Hey, I love Joe Roberts. I saw that you like did something with him. Do do you by any chance have any copies of his old book that sold out or whatever? And he's like, no, but I do have some extra prints lying around. And I was like, Oh, cool. And he's like, I'll totally send you one. I was like, all right. And when I got home, I was kind of grappling with a bunch of synchronicities that were happening all, all at once. And then the mother load hit me in the face that day when I texted you, which was like, I'm sitting there like a, a synchronicity had just happened like five minutes prior. And I was feeling this. Whoa, what the fuck? And Do you have time to describe what that one is? Sure. But goddamn. I mean, I have t- all the time in the world, but I hate. The or fa- like, yeah, let's yeah. let's do the Ninja Turtles one and then we'll we'll yeah. see what those other ones are, because I'm interested in the mountain of yeah. it. But I know the Ninja Turtles one, but I thought it'd be good to have on the yeah. on this episode. Yeah, totally. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, my God. God, like that was crazy, like about this other synchronicity. And then I realized that I had you in my ears. I'm listening to you on uh, the the Mindfulness of Doom podcast, right? And I'm listening to you and uh, there's two hosts. And I was just like getting this feeling. I'm like, 
oh, something's going to happen with this Ramin podcast because like because <laughs> like it happened before it happened before when I was at Home Depot and I that was when we had our first one I was like I was doing this laundry list of uh, errands and I forgot why the fuck I was going to Home Depot and I'm pulling into Home Depot and I'm like why am I here and then I pull into the parking spot and you said garbage disposal and I was like fuck <laughs> I was like I'm here to get a garbage disposal because oh, I forgot broken. about that one that's yeah. crazy I reminded you to get a garbage disposal without even knowing it yeah and then I sent you a message and you're like it's because I'm working on your design right now oh yeah yeah and I was like and then you're that like, was crazy you're like it's all happening and I was like oh you were like I actually uh, was just listening to this podcast about the guy from uh, Burning Man and he said synchronicity is blah 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 and I was like and then I took a screenshot of my queue, my podcast queue, and that episode of Psychedelic Salon was the next one I was going to listen to. And yeah. you were like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Greetings and welcome to the Psychedelic Salon. I'm, <laughs> I'm your host, Lorenzo. Lorenzo. And today on the podcast, we have another visit from the bar, Terrence McKenna. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. He has that weird laugh. I love that. <laughs> he seems yeah. like such a Do you ever a listen to guy. Ram Dass here and now? Oh, yeah. The, I'm Raghu Marcus. And this is Ram Dass here. And then he describes the whole episode and then he plays the actual lecture of it. That's great. That's you listen to Duncan? I just had Duncan in here. I heard. I he's my neighbor. He's wait. like, he's like right. He's literally just right across the street there. It's so funny. He lives, he just lives on the same street as me. Well, Duncan is at, um, he's a part of this web of synchronicities as well, which I mean, yeah, you know, you know what the confounding thing is about these fucking synchronicities is that they mount and they mount and they mount. And then you have this notion at this one moment where you're like, oh, great. Okay. Now this is officially too long to explain in a normal conversation. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one's ever going to fucking believe me. Thanks. Great. You know, because there's always one more. And then you're like, oh, and that ties into the. Uh, uh, That's when they start getting the straight jacket. Yeah, and they start backing away slowly and they're like, okay, like, so is everything all right? Like, you okay? Um, and all those are really are a wink to you. It mm -hmm. doesn't work on, it's not going to do much for other people. I mean, it does something for me because I'm involved in it and I yeah. got to witness it. So it's like a synchronicity to me too, but to an outsider, it's like, yeah, so what? A series of coincidences towards you. Where's my money and where's my magic from the universe? Right. Oh yeah, of course. Um, all right. Pin, getting the pin. All right. So, um, in the moment, I am sitting there thinking something's going to happen again with this Ramin thing because I had that other thing happen at Home Depot and with the podcast stuff. And I'm like, all right. And I'm texting the band the other synchronicity that happened, feeling a premonition of another one coming. <laughs> and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. Dirt, 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 dirt. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. Like, it's not weird, but the timing of it was like, huh. It like, brought me out of it. I was like, okay, go out. It's the mailman. He's been like super nice lately, bringing me my mail to my door all the time. Um, I think because I'll, I'll go out of town and then once in a while, Sarah will come with me and we'll have somebody watching our dogs, but he like forgets to get the mail. So mm. the mail backs up and the mailman just- Mail is annoying. Yeah. It's never good. No. It's and, bills and- And I always court. feel bad though, because the mailman's so nice and I almost feel like he feels like I'm neglecting him by not bringing in the mail. Yeah. So I always feel kind of bad. I'm like, all right, I got to start, to, I got to get better about this. And I have to- buy him something as a gift. <laughs> really? Uh, no, oh, that's I, very nice. That's just what I think. I'm like, I should make sure he knows that I appreciate him. It's more bring, male. Yeah. Yeah. But he brings it to my door, you know, like it's like, I, I'm sure I'm just killing time for him. But at the same time, I just feel like that was really nice, you know? So he brings uh, the, brings the mail to you. Mm -hmm. And then in that mail, I see a print on this. Well, I see the outline, a larger flat envelope. And then I see it's from Fred and I'm like, yay, like a print, my Joe Roberts print. And I just get excited. I forget all about the notion of maybe a synchronicity is going to happen. And meanwhile, podcast still rolling in my head. It's still going. I'm listening to you on Mindfulness of Doom. Haven't paused. I have my Bluetooth, uh, you know, AirPods in. So I just take them with me everywhere. And I'm, I forget that I'm even listening to shit. And um, so I'm just hammering away at this fucking envelope. I don't know. Anyone that orders art knows like it comes in like sandwiched in cardboard and and then there's tape you got to cut through and you take off one layer and then you're just getting to it like yeah i want to see this print and then i open up the print and the second i open up the joe roberts print i i see that it's a joe roberts ninja turtle 
and it says, um, plants control you. And it says, <laughs> you are a slave to plants. And then it drips down, and, and it's just like, it says DMT. And it's this Ninja Turtle. And as I see that, like literally the same exact second that I see it with my eyes, the guy on Mindfulness of Doom is like, oh, yeah, funny fact, Corey started out as a Ninja Turtle. And like, oh, that's who it- And it was just... I literally was like, ah! <laughs> like, I actually screamed out loud, like, ah! The odds of that are are astronomical. Totally. Especially because I was listening to so many podcasts of you, and I just happened... I actually started three other ones before that one, because I was like, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go with, like, I'm going to start with the more recent one. And I, like, just started there for whatever reason. And... That in itself, like the fact that I started other podcasts, I like just the timing to link up in that moment. Oh my god, chill inducing. Yeah, that's proof. Yeah, like, that's do you, what I felt. Yeah, do you ever need proof of magic again? You don't, but you're gonna seek it still. Well, one of course. When, if you don't have a synchronicity for a week, you're gonna be like, oh man, it's back to the stubborn Newtonian physics world <laughs> of, of of just balls that interact <laughs> with each other for no reason. Yeah, dude. our model of physics. In, in our head, it's, I mean, the one in my head is wrong too, I'm sure, but especially just, you know, we're taught that atoms are just these stubborn balls of material with a little piece of electricity circling it, but really it's just, it's a probability cloud around yeah. it, and man, and nothing touches either, it's just all just fields interacting with each other, that's how it's one thing, it's just fields that are are pretending to be divided interacting mm-hmm. with each other and like jack cornfield said recently it's like you know i think we were all together in the big bang and we just miss each other mm. and so now it's like we're we're coming back together we see it in our in our instagram stories we're looking at different povs of everyone and scrolling through it like okay i'm i'm ron now now i'm jessica and now mm-hmm. i'm alex now i'm this mm-hmm. and we're doing it with voice too when my voice is in your head or your mm-hmm. voice is in my head i'm for this hour i'm calling i'm mm-hmm. living his life i'm thinking the way he thinks i'm mm-hmm. not thinking the way i think maybe a little bit like because yeah. you can't turn off your mind completely but um well the punishment is you're like you get the synchronicity and like you said it's like oh, you're going to ask for more proof? Like, oh, okay, go ahead. And then you do, and then you realize, oh, my God. Uh, Well, this kind of ties into something else. And then you trace that back, and you realize, fuck, dude. But that was before I had any notion of this. And then you start realizing, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, the turtle thing goes far deeper than that. And the DMT thing on the print, like... All of these things go so much deeper and they tie into like 10 other really profound synchronicities that, I mean, okay, probably most people would pick up on the Ninja Turtle, Ninja Turtle coincidence. They'd be like, holy fuck, that's weird. But when you tie it into all this other shit, that's where it gets really, uh, what's the exciting term that uh, physicists use anytime it's something that, spooky. Oh, <laughs> like oh, spooky! It's kind of a spooky effect, you know. You're like, yeah. oh, this is which that's like that's a sign of that's something I like about um, Nassim Harriman is that he doesn't like he th- he thinks that everything after Copenhagen they've been going the wrong way and we need to step back a little bit and physics is not spooky and it's not weird action that we don't understand. It's it's doing something whether it's going into a wormhole or. It just it, there's communication, there's feedback, there's mm-hmm. there's there's actual physics, and he feels like we went away from physics when we started calling it spooky. You'll just never understand it. It's like, mm-hmm. well, then that's that's not what physics is. Then yeah, um, totally. but but what, what's one? So it's part of ten other ones. There's so many, dude. It's crazy. Well, you heard the one on third eye drops, right? Like the one about yeah, with the, the octopus, octopus and the. Yeah, that one, you, yeah. Uh, listeners can check out that one. I'm not going to make you tell the whole yeah. story. And that's the again. nucleus, you know, like, so if people want to understand the nucleus of all these, that that's it. It's, uh, you know, this experience I had with the band in Hawaii, and we took mushrooms, and we had this coincidence with the octopus chameleon being the centerpiece of it. And so there are other really strange things that happened in that mushroom trip, as as things do <laughs> when you take mushrooms. Um one of them was um, I, I, I stayed inside. We had a lot of these home base to, to beach scenarios where, you, you know, we had this house on the beach, 
So we'd go back to the house just for a change, feel some stability, and then you go, or no, back to the house, then back to the beach. Yeah, sweet like, and salty. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that's great. Uh, I so, guess the house is sweet because the beach is salt water. Hell yeah. Uh, Got some baked goods in that house. <laughs> I'm just painting a really, picture for really the listener. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and one of those journeys was going back to the house and everyone had ventured back to the beach except for Andy and I. Um, Andy's our sound engineer on this journey. and um, You've got a sound engineer that just comes with you everywhere? Um, actually, usually, usually it's this uh, gentleman named Chris, who we all call Wizard. Uh, he's been with us for over 10 years, um, but he was on another gig and couldn't do Australia, Hawaii with us, so... Andy is he recently joined our crew as our as our monitor engineer and kind of like stage manager guy. So he's the guy um, on the board the whole time. Um, he's like basically on the side stage. Uh, normally, he would be the guy on the side stage. You'd be like, oh, I need this up in my ears. And he would like do it for you. Or if you needed something up in your wedges, you would do that. Or is that normal for bands to have the same sound guy and not use the venue sound guy? Yeah, that's pretty OK. Normal. That's like, smart. Yeah. I don't know. Why I never thought that. Yeah. Well, but yeah, of course, you'd have your own sound guy. Like that's a that's such a huge part of it. Like, oh, boy, he's, he's the sixth Beatle. So many times. Yeah. Man. I mean, the reason why if anyone's ever seen us and thought we sounded good, it's because of Chris. It's not because of us. You know what I mean? And that's not the say we perform badly but if you don't have someone who understands how your music works and where he needs to boost this frequency and where he needs to take this person down and where he needs to throw this delay on anthony's vocal and yeah where he's it, playing it the whole time oh he's playing it like an instrument are and, you guys very man i wanted to i wanted to learn the whole circa discography before we had this uh this talk but you know, there's only so much time, and yeah. I chose to go down specifically the Colin rabbit hole rather yeah. than the band rabbit hole. Sure. So I do want to get into you guys, and maybe we'll have another talk some other time sure. after I know that. But are you guys very physical on stage? Do you move around a lot? Is there a lot of a theatrics? Um, I wouldn't say theatrics, but it's very emotive and very just like... Who's the most animated of the oh, five I, of Anthony, you? Anthony, 100%. Anthony's the most animated? 100%. Yeah, like he is... Yeah, he's the head of the beast for sure. Oh man, you know? I want to. I want to see the. When's the next LA show? Is it? Um, probably it'll probably be in the fall. Um, yeah, you. Yeah, definitely gotta come. It'll I'm there great. for sure. Yeah, it'll be so fun. Fall. Um, oh, that's coming up. Yeah, that's yeah. gonna be so great. What yeah. do you think it'll be? Um, you know, I'm not 100 percent sure. We've played the Shrine quite a bit. Um, have you ever been there? No. <laughs> okay. Oh, like I was saying before, I used to be so good about. Not not that I'm bad now, I just prioritize differently, but I used to love going to shows. I was just always at, at punk shows, and I loved learning about the we opening act. We were in Austin act. for so long, there's so much music Yeah, there. emos crazy. and, and oh, Red, yeah. R- Red River, and uh, man, I don't remember the names anymore now, but it's a whole slew of those buildings, and you know, you'd go see the Suicide Machines, and you'd be one of 20 people, and yeah. see AFI at La, Ro- La Zona Rosa. Uh, uh, were you were you a big AFI fan before meeting yeah, them? Are you yeah. are you are you uh, good friends with those dudes? I wouldn't say good friends, but we're we're definitely uh, friendly now that we've toured together. If you see um, each other at the grocery store, you'd say more well, than just hi. You'd be like, "Hey, have you been?" Oh hell yeah! yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I um, saw Davey Havoc at Sage, just standing outside of it, and it took me a second because. I, I forgot that he wasn't, you know, long hair and makeup, and he's got a different look now. And I was just staring at him, and I'm like, "That's not, that can't." Be. And then I, it was right when I had just moved out here, so I hadn't acclimated to the fact that, well, yeah, of course that's celebrity there. It's, yeah, yeah it's, of course it's Jeff Goldblum in front of me at Starbucks. That's not weird anymore. Yeah. And uh, I just saw him standing there, and I'm like, "Oh, that's that's crazy." I used to wait in line for hours to go see those guys, and then here he is, just just on his phone in the corner of the street. Just, yeah, that's man. how it is, and just walk walk by him. I didn't. I, I regret it now. I kind of wish I'd bothered him, but no, yeah. I didn't bother him. Yeah, I mean, like, it's definitely a weird thing to just grow up loving someone's um, art and then encountering them in this very normal way. You know, um, do you guys co-headline? Yeah, we co-headline with them, which is just fucking crazy. Um, and That's I, cool. And I still think, you know, like they're they're a bigger band than we are. And for whatever reason following or what? Um oh we we actually always they always closed, which was like so pretty much the only way we wanted to do it. Cause we like did not want to I mean, not only just because we feel like they're a bigger band, but 
it would just be weird to play after AFI. Like in our heads, you like think the the vibe is you think they take it to a vibe that yours suits better, or just because you're fans of just them? because we're fans, like, and it's just strange the idea. Like I don't know. Yeah, I'm just happy that it w- worked out the way it did, and it felt awesome playing before them every night. And some nights it was definitely like, fuck yeah, man, we we hold our own, and and like we draw a lot of people, and it just feels great. Um, but other nights it really was I could just like completely forget about the fact that I was playing and I was just watching and being like, what, what a strange, strange life. You yeah. know, I'm just sitting there having that moment of wow, I wish I could send this message back in time to my to my younger self and just say, hey, yeah, this is going to be your life one day. Um, Maybe you don't need to because that's yeah. how you ended up here is by not knowing that. Yeah. Maybe that insecurity or something, what what led you to, to do all this stuff. Yeah. I, all I know is that... It's like, oh, I can just smoke weed all day now because <laughs> my future me just came back and said I'm co-headlining with AFI. Don't, right? need to, don't need to actually learn anything anymore. Dude, right. Yeah, it's so true. Um, I think what made me think of that was I was asking about um, theatrics on stage and specifically Jade. Is it Pujet or Pujay or something? Yeah, I think it's Pujet. I know it's Jade, but man, I, I just loved his theatrics and the the spinning around with it and the you know the pink tie. Thinking back to yeah. two thousand three, um, yeah, that man. look black, all black, and then just the pink tie. <laughs> oh, it takes me back. Yeah, man. Well, those guys still, they still have, like, a cool look. They always have their own thing. And, yeah, it's so... I haven't know. checked in on the last, uh, last I think, two or three records. That kind of happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It has to. You can't possibly keep up. There's too much. And um, your tastes change. Yeah. And, and you have to be in the right place um, for anything, I think. Not just, like, music, but, like, movies, uh a book, fucking drugs, everything has to do with like kind of like your framework for how you understand what it is and how it's going to enhance your life at that moment, you know? So I, um, yeah, I think about that all the time. Oh shit. I feel like we're leaving people hanging on the synchronous. Oh, that's right. In the beach house. (laughs) Oh yeah, we do that. So after it's like, it's the sync, the whole, the whole hour arc is the synchronicities with little dives into like, Oh, did you know that band before you toured with them? Oh, that's nice. What kind of rig does he have? Oh, a galleon Kruger. You say, Oh, the four tens cab or the eight tens. Oh, two eight ten stack. You say, fascinating and then an hour goes by and for those of you still listening the story continues okay so you're at the beach house you're going back and forth between the the, yeah yeah back and forth uh salty and sweet and um i'm like no man left behind kind of guy so i try to like wait for the last person and everyone had ventured back to the beach except for andy and i and andy's like oh wait i have this thing hold on a second and he he goes into his room and he's like, I don't even know why I've had, I've had this in my touring bag for two years and I've just kept it just in case. And he takes out this giant glow stick and like, we're just like, you know, on this beach, it's in the middle of the night and just seems like, Oh sure. Of course you have a glow stick. Cool. So, um, I'm like, let's go fucking play with this glow stick. And we start heading out to the beach. Um, you know, rewind to earlier in that 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 day right as we had eaten the mushrooms nick asked me if i'd ever tripped on a beach before and i told him yeah only once with anthony and with this other guy drew we we tripped on a beach and we experienced like phosphorescent like algae and like bioluminescence for the first time ever but we didn't know what it was so it was like the most mind-bending like just just, there in the shore or what so we were on a beach and then um a stranger actually told us like oh you should go um go around the corner to the like little cove like there's this little area where all the boats are and it kind of curves out and it's a little private little we beach we took a trip uh, to garden cove <laughs> smelled like rude dog inside the van oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> keep going sorry right. about that uh, no it was great it was beautiful um, yeah I was just having this moment where I was like I'm on Ramin's podcast it like popped in for a second um, yeah so yeah private cove me and, too oh damn yeah in silence soon. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. we, well, I mean, we will, but we don't have to do it soon. I've, I just looked at the clock. We got plenty of time. Oh, fuck yeah. 
That's awesome. Yeah, maybe we'll stretch it. Maybe we'll do 20 seconds. Dude. You'll that, we'll, you'll be the first 20 seconder. Oh my god. That, that what, what you could be honor. a moment in history where it actually used to be 10 seconds until the Colin episode, then it became 20 seconds. It's like the new Twitter format. We doubled it. We doubled the capacity. Yeah. You know? People made such a big deal about that, even though you can upload videos and images of as much text as you want. It's, right. It's game over. But go ahead. Keep going. He's got the glow stick. You're, lo- you're witnessing oh, yeah. uh, bioluminescent, oh, phosphor, yeah. uh, phosphor bioluminescent, <laughs> basically glowing life in the beach. Yeah. So the glowing life in the beach thing had happened probably, I want to say, eight years prior. And Nick had asked me, did you ever trip on the beach? And I told him that story and how it was so cool and how we had never, we didn't know what it was. And then when we did find out what it was, I had never seen it ever again. It was just a thing that I learned was it's geographic. It only happens at certain times of year. It's very specific. And I was like, that's so cool that that lined up for us in that way. Um, So I told that story to him earlier. And so we're walking out the back door and we're about to go out the like there's just like you walk out the back porch of the house on the beach and then you walk out the backyard and it takes like two seconds and you go through this little patch of like tree bush thing and then you're on the beach. It's right there. So as we're going through the tree brush thing with the glow stick in hand, cracked, already glowing, I hear, God, Andy, get out here now. And all of a sudden, Steve runs up to us with his hands like cupped and he's like, look. And he's holding this like glowing piece of algae. Cool. And he had found a little like glowing piece of algae. And we're like, Oh my God. But all of a sudden I notice like, and we're bringing a glow stick out here and these guys are finding glowing pieces of algae. And, uh, it wasn't like when Drew Anthony and I had experienced it before where it was the whole beach was just like you'd step on the sand and it would light up and you would kick it and it was sparks and it was just crazy. This was like little hidden glowing gems that were in the sand and then they would come in from the ocean even and they'd be sitting there and it was like really like whoa like almost gave it a whole different kind of feeling because you could find this little glowing gem and hold it yeah. until it burned out or and whatever. you don't feel bad about it because it's algae it's not like you're killing a thing right right exactly or, i don't know it's 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 more plant-based yeah so like basically um we had this moment where we're all holding these things and then as i'm trying to find one I'm realizing they're all kind of burning out and we're not, we're not really able to find much more. So it was like found a couple and then we're just like, what is disappearing. And Brendan was with us too, a guy who wasn't tripping on mushrooms. So this all was really happening. He was there with us. It was happening. Um, and like all of a sudden Anthony fixates on the glow stick. He sees the glow stick and, and he just has this moment where he just grabs it and throws it into the water. And, like there was this all in five seconds, so many things happen. Essentially, we all go, oh, man. It was like, you know, the guy who had thrown the, the baseball over the fence or whatever. Yeah. You're like, oh, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. And he was just kind of like, I mean, it just it told me to. Like, and he just had this little thing like, it, you know, uh. it we're just like, we're just like, what are you talking about, man? Like, uh, and that was all like within two seconds that I see the effect of what happens when this glow stick hits the water and it's just sitting there illuminating this like sphere of the water and I'm perceiving it in this way like I'm watching a Disney movie and like the cliff turns into like you know the lion spirit or whatever and starts talking to the character all of a sudden this ocean is a character and it's, it's just got this one light, which just looks like it's eye almost, you know? And I'm just like having this thing where I'm seeing it and it's all kind of like processing, processing. And I think because I'm always kind of looking at the, the layers underneath of the meaning of what's happening, I'm just like, I'm, yo, glow thing, glow thing. Uh, and as I'm kind of putting that together, I see like six or seven more of those glowing embers come right from a wave, almost looking like the glow stick had given it to us, right? And we're all like, ah! And we all start scrambling to grab these things and we're all holding them again. And I'm looking at this glow stick floating in the ocean and we're all holding these glow things. And I just, in my head, I'm just like, that thing just traded us. <laughs> you know, I'm like, it was like, you give, you give me your glowy thing, I'll give you mine, you know? Uh, 
And I'm just like, I start to like try to say that out loud. And Anthony's like, just don't say it. Oh, he just knows. Yeah, he, he, knows. he understands. Yeah, he knows. I think you've talked about that, how he's got a very just intuitive connection to mm-hmm. his whatever you want to call it, source, creativity, mm-hmm. infinite fractal, which I noticed you have a fractal tattoo yeah, on your um, forearm. which It's a crop circle um, pattern called the Rosetta Set. D- Daniel Pinchbeck used to talk about What it. do you make of crop circles? Because I believe it. I think that it is hyperdimensional objects mm-hmm. showing complex extra dimensional geometry because and I know there's fake ones too but the fact that they're the corn stalks are bent perfectly and they mm-hmm. have that radiation and like oh there's it, fake ones too for sure but 100% there's no way there's no way you're going to tell me that every single crop circle was man made no way yeah. no way and it's not that crazy it's it's a we're we're these flatlanders to the four dimensional beings who are mm-hmm. flatlanders to the five dimensional beings and so on and so on and so on totally. and and why wouldn't they cuz our whole our whole life is always there for them it never goes mm-hmm. anywhere so it's why not like hey let's help out the little the little guys there mm-hmm. have you read the law of one or no. the seth material no so the law of one is this channeled book where um it's I don't know, it's a, the, a group of people, I think it was in the 60s or 80s, where a lady is the channel, like when she gets put out and then the, the being is, is speaking through her, she doesn't remember afterwards, that mm-hmm. typical type of channeling, but talks about, it's it's uh, the raw material, you know, raw, like sun raw and Egypt, and because before every statement they say, I am raw, blah, 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 we come from this extra dimensional place where all... Uh, polarities are harmonized and all paradoxes have their solution and Mm -hmm. i just love that saying they say all sorts of cool stuff like uh, that's great like uh you know in infinity is is or the word many is a finite concept when you think of many and lots of things that's referring to finite infinite means whole it's not Mm -hmm. many it's it's whole it's oneness wow and it talks about they ask it questions about uh, pyramids and stuff, and apparently pyramids were like energy charging stations and then eventually got taken over by the ruling class and then only the ruling class could use it and eventually they didn't work anymore. And something that stuck out to me was it doesn't matter what material it's made of, it's it's the geometry of yes. the pyramids and the where it was pointing and the, the channel of the Nile that made it like play into the energy naturally. And I'm wondering... Does your fractal tattoo attract synchronicities oh to you God, because no. you have it on you? Oh God, I'd never fucking thought of that ever. <laughs> oh my God, my fucking mind. You've just got the geometry bent. on you, so it knows. Like, oh, here, channel it into that. It doesn't matter if it's made of ink or or you know material. It cares about the geometry. This is oh. a geometrically based universe. Oh my God! <laughs> I mean, you just broke my brain. Oh Hell my yeah! God. That, Let's that, see how many more times I can do it. Six oh. hit combo. <laughs> oh my God! I can't believe that. Is, that is fantastic. How long I, have I you mean, had that? Uh, uh, since probably twenty eleven ish. Twenty. Okay, so for a while. Yeah, it's been there for a while. Doesn't yeah. twenty eleven sounds like the future still? I don't know yeah. how we got to twenty eighteen. All of a sudden, that I'm just here, sounds absurd. But, yeah, twenty eighteen sounds crazy to me every time I hear it. Yeah, 2016 really? and 2017 just steamrolled over us because it was mainly just politics and being shocked with politics and all that. But oh, yeah. now it's you can only be like that for so long, and now we've reacclimated to talking about everything. Yeah. There's pockets that only talk about politics, but there's still oh, other know. pockets that don't talk about it. Or not don't talk about it, like, I don't like to talk about that kind of stuff, but <laughs> it's not the only thing going on in the world. It's, yeah. Because I'm, I'm an... I'm I'm not a complete idiot, but like for that stuff in school, I don't even know what the president does. I don't know what the Congress does. I don't know what Senate does. I didn't do well in those classes, and then I'm surrounded by all these people that like claim to know how the perfect political system should work. Like, I mean, I think we should be compassionate towards each other and be mm-hmm. understanding and empathy. But as far as what legislation should do what, I don't know what the things should be. No, exactly, and it's kind of. Yeah, man, I could go for, go on forever about the politics thing, but like for me, I've had to come to a realization for myself, for my own, just like on a very basic mental health level, um, you know, had to disengage in the internet politics game and just like the 
Would you get into fights with people? Not fights. I would just try to like inform talk to people. Um, and then I think I did get more aggressive over the last couple of years with this situation. Feel like, oh, I need to be, I need to be more strong. I need to be louder about what I need, what I believe, and I need to shut people down when they're this way. And I need to protect these people and blah 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 blah. And you start this whole thing that you think is um, maybe righteous or whatever, but. For me, I realized a lot of it was wrapped in ego and a lot of it was wrapped in addiction to dopamine and, and outrage and and things of that nature. And um, it really like it fucked me up. I mean, to be real, I went through a three to four month like the worst depression I've ever after the election through. or when? No, uh, this past year, it just kind of caught up with me, I think, after. You know, I was very engaged throughout the entire election season and then all the way through the first year. Um and I think, yeah, it was just you're bathing in negativity yeah. for 24 hours a day. You're ups- like I was getting up earlier than I ever had just to fucking check Twitter and oh, look at geez. everything. You know, I was so obsessed with the fucking soap opera or whatever, you know, and um, eventually I realized how great like I just had gotten completely sucked into it. And, you know, it. I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just wasn't putting it together of how much of an impact it really was having on me, like psychologically, emotionally. And I've had depression since I was very, very young. So maybe like 12 was when I first like understood the idea that, oh, I don't feel good, you know, like mentally. Um, but this was next level. This was like nothing could snap me out of it and i was just feeling horrible and what do you try um, to do to snap out of it everything man like everything from you know exercise usually is my go-to because um you know the, just the the endorphins of it are just like the chemical works really quick for me it just gives me that i'm out of my body i'm not even thinking about the bullshit anymore but I would even go to the gym and then i would turn on politic podcasts and like i'd have you know, the, every single channel in the gym was tuned to a different station for politics and there was no escape, you know? Um, They're literally selling fear. That's what mm-hmm. any channel of, of politics is doing. If there's advertisers, they're selling fear to mm-hmm. try to get that response out of you. Oh, and while there are still horrible things in the world, it's it's the way of the world. That's that's world. It's yes. always like that. It's like, look at history. It's And we're doing better than we've ever done. And we, we you do that you know, two steps forward, one step backwards sort of thing. We might be in a step backwards sort of situation now, but I don't think it's the end of the world or anything. No. And, you know, I had to, I had to turn down some of that auxiliary noise. Um, but I will say, you know, I just started realizing that my attraction to it, um, initially, even though there are these shadow sides of it for me, like the ego stuff and the outrage and dopamine and stuff. But the core of it was that I love human beings and I I love, I have compassion for other people and I want other people to have compassion and I want, I I want people to not suffer. I want people to be like free of suffering and, you know, pause for water. (laughs) (laughs) I realized that there was this pure intention underneath of it that I didn't have to let go of. And I was like, just because I let go of politics, um, and not in a way that I'm not going to vote. I'll, I'll vote and I'm still going to support organizations that I care about. But I'm I'm not going to put my energy into fighting with people online or constantly bitching about stuff on Twitter. What I'm going to do is try to affect my fellow human beings in a real way, which is like can be as simple as um, tweeting something that helps me get through an, an you know, an emotional issue or like a psychological problem, like, you know, and I can just encapsulate it in a, in a piece of advice, not an advice, but just, this is what I do. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I needed that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and there's this gratitude that starts circulating. And then I see similarly, like those people who might say, thank you. I then look at their tweets and they're trying to spread a similar message. And I'm like, okay, that's contagious and like beautiful. And even beyond that, where the rubber meets the road is what happens when you're in front of your opposite? What happens when 
we have to deal with each other on a face to face level, like someone who thinks differently than you. Are you going to be the same way that you were in that like I'm better than you Facebook debate or whatever? You know, it's like, no, I, I want to be the I want to be able to completely hear someone say that they love Donald Trump and hate everything that I am. And I want to be able to feel I love you towards them. Like, that's just what I want to be able to feel. And I want to be able to say it's okay that you like not say any of it, but say it through my actions. Hey, go ahead of me in line. It's okay. Take my parking spot. Like, it's okay. Like, whatever. I want to, you know, uh, meet a homeless person and just give them whatever I have in my pockets and see how that means something for their life. And especially for that moment. Like that's politics. Like to me, like that is so much more powerful than tweeting and being on Facebook and bitching about the latest thing that. Yeah, you're not going to change anyone's mind either. Yeah. And so much of communication is lost on with nonverbal. We already know it's what 90 percent nonverbal, 95 percent of communication is nonverbal. So like even in an email, if you write an angry email to someone, even if you write a polite email to someone, if it's got a little bit of anything that can be kind of uh, interpreted as anger, it's going mm. to be amplified as anger. Oh, we, totally. we all do it. We all get that and like, oh, what do they mean by that? And mm-hmm. you get better at it. But yeah, social media and internet is good when it's a gateway to this type of communication. Mm-hmm. You and I face to face, now it's good that social media brought us together totally. like that. But if, it, but if it was just there, then it's kind of toxic because it's taking you away from the from the regular. Yeah, and it's like the same way you've talked about this a lot, like how, you know, the game of it, the video game of social media, where it leaves you feeling like you've failed if you get this, you know, less than a certain amount of likes or you don't have this many followers and just you're trying to win that game. So that can be a dark side of social media too, where it starts to make you feel something about yourself that isn't true. And, um, it makes you forget the whole reason why you're doing it in the first place, which is to communicate and, you know, and to accept the idea that you're being part of this um, zeitgeist or whatever, you know. And like to me, I, I try to find solace in the people that I'm affecting that I will never be aware of, the people that I will never hear from who I know they're out there who have listened to my music or gotten a postcard from someone who sent them a postcard of my art but just the postcard means something because of the words yeah. written on the back of it or like I'm like important to a lot of people but a lot of those people I will never know how I'm important to them some of them aren't even born yet you yeah. you've left you've left sound waves here that you're going to move on to a different world reality mm-hmm. frame and you're going to leave this body and yeah. those are going to be like who's this dude oh damn he died in 2079 yeah Man, missed it. Mm-hmm. But wonder what he would say if I brought his hologram up. <laughs> and then that's the next world you're incarnated is when future kids bring up your hologram to mm-hmm. ask totally. you questions. Yeah, but I think it's all about, like, we're just lucky that we do have social media that we can see even those small ripples that we make. And we, we can, we can uh, you know, we do get that confirmation of affecting people through social media. That's what's beautiful about it. You know, they can tell us, oh, I love this drawing or, you know, like just a fuck yeah or just like a heart or just you just see that someone saw your video. Like, you know, it's 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 doing its thing. Yeah. What you're doing, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, Have you seen that study of it's like apes and given a choice to have a banana or look at high status monkeys like they choose the high status monkeys? There's like some I'm like I'm butchering whatever study this is, but it just goes down to we Something about us really likes looking at high status monkeys and more importantly, looking at monkeys in our tribe, like pulling up that, seeing the little circle of the people that we know and they pop up. And it's a weird thing when people, you know, die and their little circle no longer comes up anymore. Like, not that that was your only relationship to them, but Mm -hmm. just I think about, you know, people I know who's who've died. And if I posted something that I thought was, no, I shouldn't post that. That one's that one's dumb or silly or it's not as good as the other ones. But mm-hmm. I still post it. And then I see them like it. Yeah. First, it was like, oh, that that was all I needed. Just that I got this person that I likes approval in that moment. The whole rest of the world could report it as inappropriate. Absolutely. And, it, and it makes me happy that they just like it. And they're not here anymore in this 
in this plane mm-hmm. to, yeah. to do that anymore. I think about that all the time. And, you know, you asked earlier, when do we have these conversations, if not just on podcasts? And they do happen in real life, but just not very often. And when they do, those are the special moments in our life that we're interfacing with important people. Or sometimes for me, I've had insanely profound conversations with homeless people or just a stranger who happens to be at a bar that I've gone to in a town that I'm playing or, you know, you have to allow for those people to come through the cracks and affect you. And, um, but you know, my point was just that, like, I recently had like a three hour conversation with Anthony out on a balcony in a hotel we were staying at because we had a day off and everyone was at the bar and we all went to the bar to get food. But then him and I were tired and we hadn't really just had a one on one hang in a really long time because he's got a, a family and we both live on different coasts now. You got and, kids and all that. He has four kids. Yeah. Damn. Uh, yeah. So he's like a family man and very like he's just he's a fantastic father like super dedicated and always doing that and then if not he's always creating and always moving in a in an did the kids come to the show yeah how old's the oldest eight eight okay yeah he's cool got earmuffs on probably oh yeah they all wear well james is way past earmuffs he would never do earmuffs anymore but (laughs) um yeah the rest of them all do and they must think their dad's cool then right i think so i mean they love him they love him but i think james is the only one that's old enough to perceive like I was there one time it was the first time he's ever said this apparently but he was like dad he's like yeah I googled you (laughs) and he was like why did you do that (laughs) you know and it's like what did you see (laughs) like you know what I mean like um but it was a it was a pretty like wild thing to to hear you can't stop him from it now yeah that's why we got to watch what we do like he was like I was there the day that he was born you know i went to that hospital i remember i just remember the i remember anthony before james and i know anthony like obviously after james and james was his first and like it's just a profound thing to watch um i'm sure it's even cr- much crazier for him and his to life. live it yeah. yeah see a little you tell you that it googled you yeah come yeah. to your shows man that's not dad rock at all or it's going to be dad rock someday yeah your music will be called dad rock simply because someone's dad was <laughs> making it <laughs> right exactly and uh yeah but i've they've came out on stage before and just like cut loose while we're playing like because they would just be like, I want to come up and dance, Dad. And he'd be like, cool, come up and dance. Like, like he'd be like, when this song happens, come up and dance. And, like, they'll just come out and freak out and, like, you know, whatever, break dance and jump around. And we had a moment on the last tour where Luke, who's, like, the second oldest, and James came out, and they were just going off up front. It was the last night of tour, which we just always let be completely crazy. And... um they were up front and I just saw this moment where like they connected with Anthony and they they started going like this. Like they wanted to go like stage dive. <laughs> and like he like had this moment where I could tell he was freaked out, but he's singing and he's like, ah, you know, he's like making this face like, I don't know. And then I just watched the whole thing happen where they just got like kind of like safely, you know, floated by the crowd for, for a second. Oh, so they all did it. Yeah. So the two oldest did it and it was very, yeah, I don't know. I just had this feeling i don't know do you, you ever crowd surf uh once i haven't in a while once i think ever only twice pre-age 20 mm-hmm. it's fun yeah it's, cool. it's it's different than you think it's much it more like motion around and feeling like you're gonna fall every second and yeah. then you drop like two feet and like oh that was the time where i'm dead and yeah. oh i didn't and then eventually it's over and you're like yeah i did it i should have enjoyed it more instead of being afraid of every little step of it, and then you apply that life lesson mm, to the rest of exactly. life. Do you guys still do warp tour or anything like that? No, and apparently, apparently, it's this is this year is the last warp tour. Really? So they can't cut it anymore. They're sick of it. <laughs> I think what they're doing is they're probably just gonna they're gonna rebrand of sorts, like Lollapalooza did, and do. I'm sure they're pro- they haven't said they're doing this, but I'm sure they will. Where where they'll it's not a tour, it's a just couple, one show. Yeah, or like a couple select cities, and that's it. Yeah, um, <clears> that's cool. I did that. I went to that first Lollapalooza that was not the tour. I oh, think yeah. like 26 or 2006, Is maybe that Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah we toured fun. with um, we toured with Jane's Addiction and and Allison Chains and oh cool yeah and 
yeah, just being around Perry was very like, whoa. Is he a <laughs> nice know? guy? Nice oh, fellow? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Like, really, really kind. Let's go! <laughs> Dude, you kind of have a little bit of him in your, in your uh, vocal stylings. Um, they can't do it! Yeah, dude. Like, but yeah, uh, yeah, he's very... Just knowing what he kind of created was kind of, whoa. Isn't vocals such a strange thing? It's like, you've got to commit and go all the way in. Like, because mm-hmm. if you're, if you don't turn the dial all the way in for that ridiculous voice, it's going to sound, it's going to sound stupid. But yeah. if you're completely leaned into it, then it's like, that's like, whether it's, I don't know, Perry or Anthony or Davey Havoc or, oh, yeah. um, just I don't know. I don't know why I'm putting them all in that because because it's higher registered yeah, higher ones register, yeah, and yeah. might be it's like more on the feminine side. But mm-hmm. now it's like okay to be that. Maybe it never was okay. You have to like keep pushing the boundaries of like no, yeah. a man can sing like this too and still. Yeah, I think about John Anderson from Yes or like you know uh, Getty Getty Lee. <laughs> Is that your cat? Yeah, let's he, go get him. And then uh, he's like, I have a high the, voice too. He's like, yeah. I can sing. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go get him, and then we'll we'll resume this in in just a second. Hell yeah! And we're back. I guess we should do the 20 seconds of silence now, but I don't know. It seems like you should put silence after there's not been silence, so we won't do it now. We'll. Okay. And this is edited seamlessly. It sounds like we just came back. Mm. Maybe I should cut this part out. No, I won't. I'm not cutting this part out in. <laughs> if if you listen for this long, then you're already you're well in to oh, the yeah. to the deep nitty gritty. I don't even remember where we were. I don't think we were anywhere. We were talking about high pitched voices, uh Perry, Pharrell. Yeah, we were tangenting basically, I think, um from Oh yeah, Warp Tour. Warp yeah. Tour is shutting down now or mm-hmm. they're changing their their brand. To, that's a ridiculous thing to take on the road. How do you organize something like that? Dude, right? Like so in crazy. parking lots of a Astrodome or something? Yeah. I used to go every year. I went from 99 to 2005 or something. I went that first, I think 99 was like Blink-182 and Eminem and <laughs> then uh, Bad Religion the next year and Less Than Jake. Uh, oh, yeah. We were on it with Bad Religion one year. Um, Those dudes are cool, right? Oh, they're cool as shit. And I was obsessed with Minor Threat when I was younger. Oh, yeah. Uh, they've got one of the... I think Brian, right? Brian, is Brian the, Baker, yeah. Yeah, he's one of the guitarists for for Bad Religion. Yeah, we were playing one day, and I looked over, and I saw them watching us side stage, and I was like, what the fuck? Why are they watching us? Oh, my God. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, my kid got me into you guys. And I was like, wow. That's oh. awesome. I was like, holy They probably shit. feel the same way. They're probably feeling like, oh, we're the old guys now, and these are, like, the new, like, good band. And then you're you're looking at them like, no, those are the important guys. And they're like, <laughs> no, that's the new blood. We're old. We're, we're obsolete now. I've had so many moments like that. It's so, so weird. Let's go back to uh, you said you got into Zappa a little bit. Did you ever get into Prince at all? Yeah, I mean, well, I've, I've always, every time I hear Prince, I'm like, what is this? Oh, th- I fucking love this. You know what I mean? Over the years. And um, I think recently, though, probably just through listening to you talk about him a lot. And then I do bring him up a lot, don't I? Well, yeah, he's just one of your guys. Yeah. This is one of my guys. <laughs> he's one of the guys. Uh, um, but uh, you're not the only person. You know, I've had other people tell me how, how much they loved him. And, and also a guy that we toured with, um, he, to- whoa. Yeah. Helicopter. Yeah. These um, mics pick it all up. Yeah. That was great. Um, I don't live in an actual helicopter <laughs> landing area. That's just, that's what happens in LA. You just hear helicopters every now and then. Yeah. Uh, so we, we uh, toured with a band who was tour managed by a guy who used to tech for Prince. And so he told us stories and he, you know, he, he, he loved him. He, 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 he was probably nervous as shit, though, all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. can't screw up on that job. Mm-mm. And uh, yeah, he definitely he told us some cool stories. I don't really remember much, much about them, but um, in general, it was the typical thing you would think about, about him being kind of difficult or just hard to please or had little idiosyncrasies that were strange and um, who are your guys? My guys. You know, I have a lot of guys. Um, 
Me too. And gals, actually. Um, like, Bjork is a huge one. Yeah. Um, when I say guys, I mean, like, I refer to it's I like, refer to girls, the girls as guys, too. Yeah. And I think, like, I always hear Marin say it. Yeah, he's like, who are you guys? Yeah, I just yeah. want to be one of the guys. Yeah. I think his is Keith Richards. No, I know his is Keith Richards. Yeah. That's his main one. Yeah. Uh, so... You've got a lot of podcasts, too. Yeah. Seems like. I do, too. I have a lot of podcasts. Everything oh. from... Uh, I always bring up... Uh, Positive Head podcast on the left and Come Town on the on the right, <laughs> not politically, but just whatever spectrum of like positivity versus juvenile, just dick jokes, uh, yeah, type of thing. I like it all, and I've gone through. I guess I've gone through phases where I've been like, yeah, like I went down the you know the Pete's podcast and and uh, and Marin were like my thing for a long time. Me and too. That, and that was the format that I enjoyed. And I ripped off their format, me and a guest. It's great. <laughs> That's the format. It's perfect. And I yeah, I actually just remember like Marin is like I have to say he's one of my guys. <laughs> he as a guitar player? No, no, just like That'd be interesting. <laughs> just as See, that's the thing. My I don't have like guys for like guitar I mean I have a few but like mostly I just have people that I'm like your your whole like trajectory is like amazing yeah you know that's I mean? good that's good that you're not limiting it to the instrument well I think it's also probably because that's how I see myself and that's how I that's how I see my journey is just it's all things not just guitar or not just painting or not just whatever like I I'm starting to realize it's everything. It's not just all those things. Yeah, and you can't help but not when you create a thing or express a thing, it's going to have your signature on it yeah. too, no matter what, whether it's a musical thing or a you might have heard me on this podcast talk about it, how the color wheel and the sound mm-hmm. wheel match up to each other the, the way Coltrane they, fractal. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's mm-hmm. all the same thing. So it's not like I'm a visual person, I'm a sound person. It's the same vibratory yeah. soup that you're playing with. So who are some of your few guitar guys? Okay, I love Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead. Um, his style is so weird and cool and um, borderline sloppy, but almost on purpose, so it's almost like, no, it's even more technical. It, like, drags a bit? Uh-huh. Yeah, the, we all have a tendency to rush or drag. I have a tendency to rush, mm-hmm. and then there's some people that have a tendency to, to drag, and actually that's what people like about them. Mm-hmm. That they, I definitely rush, too. They're just a little bit behind on it. Yeah, you have to... It's weird. Counting seconds in your head, where does a second come from? Like, you're just making it up. Like, yeah. one, two, <laughs> three, four. Maybe drummers are better at it, but it's still... Like, that's not my tempo. Go on. So, uh, yeah, Johnny Greenwood, Radiohead. Yeah, Johnny Greenwood. Uh, definitely. Um, so I love Jeff Buckley, too. Like, I mean, he had a very short career, but um, as a guitar player, he's so strange and interesting. Um, I A lot of Jays, I realize now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I really... I love I love George, George Harrison. I'm one oh, of those guys. Oh yeah, the documentary yeah. is so good. I bring it up. I think yeah. every day. Well, it really is. It's something else. It's really powerful. Uh, it's a lot like I feel it's as important as the Shanling documentary, which is just unbelievable. Yeah, they're kind of the same when you think about it in mm-hmm. different ways. Yeah, but where it follows this one man trying to, you know. Like they both had anger, they both mm-hmm. are trying to find Zen when they themselves are naturally not Zen. There is, mm-hmm. there was two sides to George. There was George, and then there was George. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way you could put it. Exactly. George, and then there was George. <laughs> God damn! All those guys are just so goddamn witty. It's amazing. Uh, I yeah, I, uh, so I love him, and I feel pretty much exactly the way you feel about him, you know, underrated and, and just like most interesting and just totally like his songs were so cool. And the stuff that he added to the Beatles was just, you know, for me, like they're not the Beatles without, without it. Yeah. It's just so part of what makes them so fascinating to me. Um, I mean, all of them do that. And I guess that's, that's the back to the whole democracy collaboration thing even though i know they're much different they're way more complex and crazy as far as their dynamics but yeah um so he's and that's one. such a different time too like the way they're making records is so different than, oh than what's going on now and the whole landscape too and sharing stuff and 
Did um, you ever read um, the sometimes. the book about? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever read the book about the White Album, the making of it? No, I want to. It's really I'm cool. late to the Beatles game and to the Rolling Stones. I was game. late to the Beatles too. Yeah, because you see it as your you know the generation above views music, and then we get into whether it's punk or hardcore alternative, like I don't know in the '90s what Incubus and Green Day and and 311 and stuff like that. I was mm-hmm. I, I love that stuff and mm-hmm. I still I still do it after having left it for a bit and then came back to it. I think I talked to Matt Ingerbretson about this how you're you grow up liking a certain type of music and then you feel ashamed for liking it and mm-hmm. then you come full circle where you're like, "Okay, now I get why I liked it and I can actually like it. And not everything has to be this pretentious pitchfork musical mm-hmm. taste towards people." Now apply that to your own music because <laughs> I've gone through that with Circa you know what I mean in this way well actually we've gone through that you know it's funny you brought up Warp Tour but we went through this time where it was like how do we shed being the Warp Tour band you know and it yeah. was this thing like and then it just dawned on us don't do Warp Tour <laughs> and don't do these other things but we had done it already which was great and Warp Tour as an experience absolutely mind-bending and amazing and probably one of the most fun tours I've ever been on. Like, it's literally like a traveling summer camp. You make so many friends and it's just, you play for 20 fucking minutes and that's it. Oh yeah, you know they are mean? short sets. Huh? Yeah, and you never know when you're going to play, so you have this novelty of like, oh, we're playing first today, get it done, and then you have this whole day ahead of you, or you're playing last and the sun's going to be going down in your set and you're going to get this uh, crowd at the end that's very unique and weird and not the typical warp Tour crowd. Um, and then other times you're basically the main event and you're smack dab in the middle when everyone still has energy and you're having this amazing... Is there a lot of partying and drug use and stuff behind the scenes if, afterwards? If you want it. Um, it's there to find but it's definitely not the main thing. The main thing is the, is the, is the camp vibe. The, that's cool. It, yeah, the main thing is everyone... Because there's huge factions of people on Warp Tour that are um, vendors and people like working for various companies like like just have a merch tent set up and these people become what define Warp Tour for you because they're the people you're traveling with essentially they're like your touring buddies and oh I'm gonna go have lunch with so and so who runs the the eco whatever like the people in charge of making sure that there's recycling in every city and yeah you like, never think about it yeah or the people that are doing the like anti-smoking campaign or whatever like they're all these cool people that are on the thing and they're there for you to hang out with and meet and you know we just made so many friends there immediately and we were like oddballs and yeah so I loved Warp Tour it was just that there was a specific point of time that you're like you're kind of touching on it it would be you know we're talking about it in a personal way of like you go through this time of feeling ashamed for what you liked but in reality there are trends in music and there are sometimes you're part of something that isn't going to last and you see yourself as beyond that and you don't want to have the same life cycle as the thing the genre or whatever it is or you know the trend so that was important to us to you know, we're not just a warped tour band. We're not just a. That's smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we are what we are. And we realized pretty, like, right around that same time, that was probably mid, you know, us signing to a major, which is just this strange thing. And I don't reference it to be like, we're so cool. We signed to Atlantic Records. It's like, it was a profound mental shift to go from very, like, small budget recording to all of a sudden, a guy like genuinely thinking that when Anthony joked and said he wanted to be surrounded by sharks, <laughs> <laughs> that he thought he was being real and said, we can make that happen. Like that kind of reality is just ridiculous and crazy. And it feels like you're in a movie. So I, when I note that, when did that happen? Uh, that was like right around, 2008 or so. Oh, so we you've signed. had a decade of being in the big leagues. Well, we did that. We only did it once, though. So we did it. It was perfect. It was like the most perfect thing ever. We we signed to Atlantic right when like the door was closing on 
big labels um, still giving like decent money to underground bands to be themselves and those not days change. are done now. Huh? Oh, yeah. oh yeah, definitely. like far done. I mean, they still cleaned up even. They'll pick up small bands, but you're you basically they own you. Like you know what I mean? They take huge percentages and um, you know. I forget what they even call it, but they have some kind of like it's a deal where they're essentially they, they get a piece of every single thing you do, even when you go out on tour and you're just alone. They're getting money from yeah, you. Yeah, that was and another like, cool thing about Prince is that he was so uh, he fought back against that so hard, especially as a black artist, seeing his uh, right contemporaries on his face. before him. He was like, "No, I'm not going to let this happen to me," and then took it too far in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. And it's hard when you're in that moment and you don't, you don't, you have to, but it's hard to step out of yourself for a second and realize eventually if we do what we want to do and we keep going, this is going to just be this blip of the whole thing. You know what I mean? So it's just about being in the moment, loving every experience that's good learning from the bad and making better decisions over and over and over again until all of a sudden you're like, we've been a band for 14 years. Ugh. Like, yeah. it just goes. You know what I mean? But if you just go from decision to decision and mo creative moment to creative moment to performance to performance to days off, months off, a year off sometimes, um, eventually, if you just keep it going and you have that connection with those people still, and people still care about what you're making. Like these are a lot of variables, but that's what this has been. It's just been like moment to moment to moment, and all of a sudden I'm fucking here. Yeah, you've it's... maintained your authenticity, and your fan base likes that, and has probably grown up with you. Yeah. Where it's probably not the same age kids. It's probably maybe it's those kids, but they've grown up now. There are there's always um, a small percentage of new people, but mostly, and I'm dead serious when I say this, there are people who I meet every show who are like, I grew up listening to you in high school, like I was 16 when I first heard you, and they're sitting there and they're kids with them. And you're cool. just like, like the first time I saw you was 10 years ago, and you're like, what? <laughs> you're like, you went from being a kid to having a kid, just like people in our band have, but you've stayed with us, and you still pre-order our albums, and you still care about us the way, you know, we care about them and so it's really profound and crazy. that's awesome yeah we get that all the time we'll be right back with a question after this 20 seconds of silence are you ready fuck yeah let's do this boy that was a good one and we're back this is the first time i've done it as a as a radio kind of style of voice wow. where i like ease out of it normally i'm like oh that felt good but this time we're back <laughs> on the hits and now we're here with colin from circus survive talking to him about major record deals oh, God. uh so during your your deepest three month bout of depression mm -hmm. does 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 that not do anything for you like seeing that you've impacted those people and like that they're they're coming to your shows and stuff or does the depression happen when you're not connected to an audience when you're not playing music or do you get depressed literally when you're like there's a show i'm at the show right now i'm playing this song but i'm just not here with it i'm faking it i've i have personally i can say this legitimately i've never i've never consciously faked it i may have had times where i felt distracted or like Mm, um, especially times, say, when I'm, like, playing through, like, feeling really awful physically, like, if I'm sick or um, something's happening with my family or something, whatever, which I've had to do all those things, you know? Um, but I've never consciously been, like, I'm so sad right now that, I, that I'm faking this. Um, Circa is a total gift in that every performance of our entire career... I've been in, I've found flow every single time, every fucking time, every single one, every single one. Oh, that's beautiful. I've disappeared every single time I've played in this band. And I can't say that for every other performance I've ever had with any other project, all the way from being a young person to playing music all the way to now. 
Circa is the only experience I've, I've had where consistently every single time we play, I lose it. I lose myself. That's beautiful. Yeah. I feel like, um, you know, you know that Tragically Hip? Yeah. You heard of them? You mm-hmm. see that documentary? No, I haven't seen it. Well, the, basically the dude gets the lead singer guy, Gord, which the only Canadian people are named Gord. And there's actually two guys named Gord in the band, short for Gordon. But he's got a brain tumor thing and he's dying and they... Uh, he's very like present after that. Like he he before they go on stage, he says to all his bandmates, "I love you," and then looks at him at the face and then kisses him on the lips, like the big, big. I'm never gonna see you again. Kiss and then they go uh, tour Canada and play all their songs from all their records ever. And just a lot of people in that documentary are talking about how they did it. So many bands are just torn apart and there's so much politics and stuff and they did it they stuck together and they landed safely they took their hot air balloon and sailed it around the whole world and brought Mm -hmm. it back to a landing and now now he's done so or he's he's in the ground now so he can't you can't take that legacy yeah away uh it's beautiful do you feel like you'll you guys will always do it and grow with it or do you feel like you'll call it quits one day or you just never know um well i think one thing i was going to just say is that um you like we tell each other that we look we we say i love you before every set like we we huddle before every set you've got a ritual pre-show ritual yeah and and we don't plan to say i love you but it just kind of sort of happens and then um every tour will have a different thing that we say it it just kind of like we'll be like what should we say does does it do you ever like joke and one guy's like i love you man and you're like (laughs) <laughs> just leave him hanging just one one out of every hundred shows just leave him hanging before before you go on stage i don't think there's ever been that but there's always there's always the occasional uh anthony has a running joke that he's the silliest right or oh, who's the silliest oh, we're all pretty damn silly but anthony's consistently can crack pretty much anybody up um he's just got something he can turn it on at any point and uh <laughs> You know, he'll he'll jump at any chance he can to huddle when there's one person missing, and he'll be like, "Let's all let's all be thankful for Brendan's not here." Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Let's all just like give thanks right now, and like, That's you funny. know, he'll always have that. So you know that if you're not there, you're definitely people are grateful you're not there. <laughs> they have that moment of where they joke about it, but um, yeah, I mean, I think the way we look at it is. As long as we're being honest and it feels potent still and important and it feels like special still and and it's not we don't want to like drag the legacy of what circuit is through the mud. So if there's ever a point where it's just getting to, you know, it's sad. That's what bad religion would say about uh, them. It's like, well. We don't want to get to that point where we're playing state fairs. No offense to state fairs. We love going to the state fair. We just don't want to perform at one. Yeah. And at least not out of necessity. Like, um, you know, you want to... We just want to feel that when the band ends, it ends on a high note. And we want to we wanna basically... Like, we just feel so grateful for the 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 entire experience that we've gotten with it and what we have with our fans that... It would be so tragic to just kind of like, you know, I don't know, just completely just drag it through the mud and make everyone feel terrible about it and feel like I never want to listen to that band again because I had this terrible like feeling of I've I've witnessed them just degrade themselves or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like we just want people to feel good about it the way we feel about it. And um, so one day that, that day could totally come where we're just like. It's time to end it. it. It could happen a month from now, to be honest. I mean, we have plans. Yeah, I hope not, because I was going to go to that show in the <laughs> yeah. fall. But yeah, try to try to kill it off in like six months or yeah. something. Right. Um, I think we always say that any Circa tour could always be the last Circa tour. And we accept that and love that and know that at this point, like, there's always more to do, right? But, you know, we've just done so much more than we initially thought we ever would. So it puts you in a really cool place. We just feel super grateful about all that shit. And That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful for it and I'm not even a part of it. It's like, <laughs> it's that, it's that radiant of a thing. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that's, that's what we like. That is a major reward. You know what I mean? Um, I remember always thinking about, you know, being younger and writing music kind of maybe before Circa or even in the beginning of Circa where like, Actually, no, I never felt this during Circa now that I think about it. But 
wishing you had an, a, an interesting enough story to be what you see in these other people, like these heroes of yours or these legends of music and art and film and just feeling like, oh, I'm probably never going to do anything that, that amounts to anything because my story is so boring. Like you're not as interesting as Freddie Mercury or yeah. something. You mean. Yeah. And you like, or whoever, like all these people seem to have these amazing stories. And then you realize yeah, because you're you're in it still. You don't understand what's special about your yeah. story. You don't understand what's what's going to be like the main thesis of your paper. You know what I mean? Like you don't get it yet, but you know. Like, yeah, if the Wikipedia of you was done already, then you could just you could be dead. Oh, and like that's it's a, not done being written. That's such a crazy thing to bring up because like. I wanted my own Wikipedia for so long. I was like, oh, God, I want my own Wikipedia. And now, like, I'm like, I wish I didn't have that Wikipedia. Oh, really? Cause Why it, is that? Because it's just, it's so incomplete. And, you know, you can't update your own Wikipedia. Other That's people true. do it for you, right? And people, I've just never been the type of person, I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to put this on myself. For whatever reason, my shit does not get updated and it doesn't reflect me at all. Like, it's very out of date. At least the last time I've seen, seen it, which it was a while ago, granted. But I, I I just read it and I'm like, that's not me. It doesn't even like remotely touch on where I am right now. And That's interesting. And it doesn't talk about, let's say, like the paintings or anything. I mean, it, it basically, I think the sentence that's on there was written when I first started painting as, as also a guitar player, which was like before we were even on Warped Tour. You know what I mean? What does that mean, painting as a guitar player? Like... Like I was painting, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like, I'm the guitarist of Circa who also paints. You um, know what I mean? Like the way that Anthony Hopkins, it's like, and he also paints. Right. But it's like, but we're only here because it's Anthony Hopkins. Right, right, right. So like, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. What was I saying? I just got lost for a second. I mean... I basically... Incomplete Wikipedia, wishing it oh, wasn't yeah. there. Yeah, I used to really want one, too. And yeah. actually, if I had the choice of if there was a button here where it's like you get one and you don't get one, I'm going to press the get one totally. one because it increases your clout and you can That's, get more, uh, yeah. like, you can have... It's just true. You could have more interesting conversations with more range of people if I had millions of followers as mm -hmm. opposed to thousands of followers. Totally. Just And then I would get to have that conversation. But now I'm I'm too little of a of a thing but the advantage of that is then i can have more like we could if if this was a huge show more stuff would get reposted and misconstrued and like oh did you hear the thing that they said there like that could they they're gender insensitive or something of of mm -hmm. that one but now it's it's too low under the radar to be <laughs> that and also i don't think we said anything offensive but no um no but i no i totally understand what you're saying and um do you watch Black Mirror? Have yeah, all of it. Okay, so the the one about the you know with the credits, like, like the credit system. Yeah, China's got that now, right, or something. Well, I think there is something like that brewing over there. I don't know if that's actually in place, but the just, Orville did a good one of that too, and that was I think parallel thinking. They came out at the same time. I don't know if you watched the Orville, but um, it's the know. new Star Trek show. Seth oh, no. MacFarlane made. Oh, no, I'm no. the only human being in the whole world <laughs> that watches it, and I guess some people on the internet do, but people I know that are Star Trek fans, I'm like. Do you see the Orville? And they're like, no. And then, oh, I tried to show my brother who loved Next Generation. He's got a kid now; doesn't have time for it. So it's just it's just me alone in the lighthouse watching the Orville and trying to bring up references to it. But they do a great episode of the voting system and how people are subjected to that voting system, and then they have to go on an apology tour, and it's called the apology tour. And it's like I'm deeply regretful of my actions, and I'm ashamed, and. I'm going to change my ways. And then people re-vote. And if your vote goes more than a million down votes, then they give you a lobotomy. That's the episode. Wow. There's well, a great line in it where the... the uh, I don't even know if I'm going to say it as funny as it is. Man, just go watch it. It's not going to be as funny if I say the line. Now you don't even know what the line is because you have to go watch... You have to go watch Jay Lee say that line. Oh man, I gotta go rewatch that Orville. But yeah, Wikipedia. Well, you didn't want a Wikipedia. Well, you know how you you know how uh, we're just talking a lot about like becoming everything and how like technology and biology will like merge and all this stuff. And then if you really think about you know like fucking cryptocurrency and like all the different types and then VR and all the like and AI and uh, 
What's the other R? The vulcanization of epistemology. AR, yeah. All these things. The concrescence of all things into one. Yeah. So it would only make sense that, of course, Wikipedia would go away. And, of course, uh, verified accounts would go away. And, of course, all these things would go away. And then it would just kind of eventually simplify into just credit. And, uh, you know, so many things can be credits. And it's almost amazing that we're not there already to me really we just keep fragmenting these like reward systems and until eventually it's like no like it's just going to be a credit a credit gets you food a credit gets you this a credit you know it's just all a credit and um so yeah hopefully that'd be cool if there's a base income too like you get base like no matter how low your credit is you still get food and shelter because you're a cell yeah. in the larger organism and we want to take care of you but then if you want more, then you have to do a little dance or something yeah. or play guitar with your All the things teeth. that are magical to us, everything uh, that we find to be, you know, like special or or being good, or, you know what I mean? Like all these things would get you credits and every time you, um, you know, however many people you inspired in your stand-up show that walked out like... Two. <laughs> those, Over, those, overall <laughs> those two people they walk out and like you've gotten these extra credits for the effect that you had on them because they checked a box in their in their mind they let out a frequency that said i was affected in this way so give me these extra credits you know what i mean yeah um, it would be cool if it was set up to that just flow of it you are actually getting credit for the value that you actually provide as opposed to right now it's just manipulating numbers and it's mm -hmm. it's based on nothing and yeah we could go in that whole federal reserve bank <laughs> rant of that just we're obsessed with these green pieces of paper with a pyramid and an eye on top of it oh yeah i mean i need them i need the pyramid i've got i've got a stack of them there it's not a large stack but see there's a little stack of green papers with a pyramid and an eye on the top of it it's a nice little thing um, you said you used to go down conspiracy rabbit holes do you mm -hmm. still revisit it sometimes now it's, it's interesting yeah always uh Especially, I, I think, like a good one. I yeah. don't like the shoddy ones, but I like a good one where it's like you, this. This could be a thing. Yeah, I don't think I've really um, indulged in any lately um, because I've just been consumed with like synchronicity and very strange things happening to me. So uh, it hasn't made me want to seek outside weirdness. I'm like almost like, you know, af after the Ninja Turtle one, uh, I was like. Cutting off outside stimuli <laughs> now, and then another one fucking happened, even after I did that. Um, but I feel like the need to, um, like, just tie a bow around the, the glow stick one. So, if you would allow. Oh, of um, course. Uh, so, um, the glow stick thing happened, and our last embers burned out, and the glow stick's still floating. And then all of a sudden, it's like the fun stops, and Nick's like, oh my god. What if like, what if like a turtle fucking eats that thing and chokes on it? Like we gotta get that glow stick, and we're sitting there, and Anthony's like, "Oh no! Like I did a bad thing!" Like he just had this moment of like, "Ah!" And he like kind of like walked back to the the porch, and then you know I think he was kind of having like, you know, as mushrooms work on you, they come in waves, like no pun intended, but like they come back and overwhelm you at times and you're like, I gotta go sit yeah, down. Right? I think different pieces of it digest and yeah. like break down so you get yeah. a dose of the psilocybin later. And I especially think. if you're feeling any kind of like feelings, <laughs> like yeah. if, if it can, like if he had a moment of feeling guilty for throwing it in there, like I could see how it could overwhelm him. Okay. And uh, so he walked away for a minute. And, I'm, and, and I'm catching that you said not a fish or an eel. You said a turtle. So I'm uh -huh. guessing Ninja Turtles might play back into this, <laughs> but I want to see where this goes. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so Nick says, yeah, what if a turtle eats that glow stick and chokes? And, and Anthony walks away for a second and then... Brendan follows him, and then Steve, like, makes the joke, like, guys, everything's going to be fine. But if the cops come, I wasn't here. Like, <laughs> if, if, they, if we do kill a turtle, um, I wasn't here. And we're just like, fuck you, Steve. And uh, Nick, Nick, Andy, and I all share a similar quality where, um, you know, we all have played dad in the band, um, you know, not so much Andy for our band, but for other bands, he's been 
a dad type figure where when people are getting out of hand or shit happens, like you're there to clean up the mess or you're there to kind of just like make sure like shit doesn't get too crazy. Or if you have to pay for something that you fucking broke, you're going to, it's out, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're all just three dads sitting on the beach, looking at this glow stick floating there. Like we got to get this fucking thing, but it's like further away than it was. And it's kind of scary. It's nighttime and we're on like, you know, psilocybin mushrooms and the riptide is... I would have just said, fuck the turtle. Right. Yeah, it looks like you guys were deeply invested in being good. Yeah, we're like, we need to get this thing. Um, Well, especially because mushrooms just make you overwhelmingly aware of nature in this way that you're just like, I cannot fucking leave that in the ocean. And we're just like feeling terrible and we're like, and like, I think Nick was like, one of them said something like, man, this was like the coolest story that's ever happened. And now I feel like I can't tell it because we're going to kill a turtle at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and like we're shrugging and kind of eoring back to the, to the house feeling bad because we're just like, we can't risk the riptide. It's too far. And um, then Nick goes back inside and I'm sitting there with Andy on, on, the, on the porch and we can see <laughs> the fucking glow stick still in the ocean from our from our back porch and we're just sitting there talking and Andy brings up oh he's like um or what what did I say oh I said something about how Nick and I are alike because we're both cancers and um and then Andy's like I'm a cancer too and he's like you know what's kind of interesting is that that thing that we found earlier that we thought was a star was actually Venus. And right there is actually the constellation of cancer. It's been staring at us this whole time. And like this trip, I had this really special moment with Nick. And then I had this really special moment with Andy right after this, where I was like, Oh my God, the glow stick. It's like 10 feet closer. Look. And he was like, grab the flashlight. Let's go. We fucking ran down to the beach and he's like, just keep that thing on me. And I'm like in the water with him. Like the water's like up to my chest. Just he, went in with clothes and everything. Yeah, I just went in. Cause I actually went in with a blanket too. Cause I had this blanket that was like my security oh, blanket damn. for a while. So I'm like, I can't imagine how this looked. It must've looked amazing. It must've been so fucking funny, but I'm in there with this blanket and I'm up to my like chest and water and Andy's swimming and I had the flashlight on him and I'm like yelling that he can do this and like you can get it and he like grabs the fucking glow stick and we we have this triumphant moment when we get back to the beach and we're just like yes we can fucking tell the story and the turtle lives like um water break um so we get back and then we're like yeah we got it and they're like good job guys and Anthony makes this joke he's like yeah, good job saving the turtle that's going to come back to kill you. <laughs> like, you know, just like this fucking classic Anthony line. And then the fucking DMT Ninja Turtle arrives uh, via, you know, that synchronicity. And I couldn't stop thinking, like, a Ninja Turtle just came back to offer me DMT. Like, basically... Be- Wait, how does, how does the DMT Ninja Turtle find its way back? Or you're saying that... The print, the print from Joe Roberts is of a Ninja Turtle and it says plants control you and it says DMT on it because it's like a DMT inspired painting, right? But how does it come back? Well, it basically, I mean, I guess not literally comes back, but the turtle that we saved in the ocean. Oh, is that turtle? Is the Ninja Turtle. Oh, okay. There we go. (laughs) I was just making sure that wasn't like it somehow arrived at the same time of it. No, no. Like, so yeah, the, the DMT Ninja Turtle shows up. And I just started thinking about how DMT represents death to me in a lot of ways. And it represents like um, this kind of unfinished story for me in a, in a lot of ways. You ever hear what McKenna said about uh, DMT where he's like, uh, where, where you're sure you're dead and you think, <laughs> what else could it be? <laughs> you do a great impression of him. That's fucking <laughs> great. You need to do that one more. That one's good. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, it just kind of started giving me the heebie-jeebies and creeping me out a little bit, um, you know, because I've been fixating on on smoking DMT a lot and thinking about it, and I've only had one extremely aesthetic experience. I have never broken through, and I, I've I've read so many books on it. I wrote a paper about DMT and alien abduction in college. I was obsessed with it all the way back in. What class is that for? <laughs> it was actually for uh, AP. It's like F. This is a string <laughs> paper. <laughs> no, that's the thing. It was literally write an argumentative research paper about anything you want, but you have to prove something 
through this paper. Uh, so I was like, I want to prove that alien abduction ph- phenomenon ties into DMT. And so I wrote this whole research paper. about. I'm actually going to put it out in a zine soon oh, with, cool. with, with notes and stuff because I think it's really funny. But um, so, yeah, this weird obsession with DMT. And, you know, I've read the spirit molecule many, many times. I've listened to like lots and lots of interview, interviews about it. And I loved your start. Your one story, by the way, was just fucking great. I like laughed out loud. Oh, on Shane's? Well, no. Uh, well, you, you, you told a little bit of it. On very eight. Oh yeah, on very eight. Where you were like, I'll send you back if you want. Just tell me which one it is. And yeah. I was like, Oh yeah. <laughs> like that just got me. But uh but yeah, so I then started fixating on the idea of like, oh, like the ninja turtle that's gonna come back to kill me. Like and in my mind, not the literal sense, but like, you know, I was thinking about how <laughs> well, this is what's been dawning on me. I'm I've been telling these stories now on podcasts yeah the last two about this and i really have never really been that open about a lot of my experiences but this one for whatever reason felt like all right the octopi chameleon must get out to the world i must tell everyone (laughs) about this and i'm realizing that i'm totally manifesting the dmt experience just by doing this i'm putting it out there and i'm people are going to hear this people are probably going to walk up to me at a show and give me fucking dmt now because honestly it's been out of reach for me for many times and i told myself i'm not going to try that again until it just happens you know right so i yeah it's just been this interesting weird echo in the back of my mind that this weird thing has has brought me here in a strange way and I know that sounds kind of loony to a lot of people, but um, there's more. Like, so that all happened, and the Ninja Turtle happened, and I was like, "Fuck!" Uh, and I, sh- I shoot the text to everybody else, and as I send that, Brendan's like, "Dude, I'm in the, I'm in line in Whole Foods right now as I'm reading your text," and the cashier goes. Is that an octopus tattoo on your arm? And he said, "No, it's a giant squid." And she's like, "Oh, I always wanted an octopus tattoo." And he was like, "I really would like to continue this conversation, but I have to go." And he left, and he texted me that. And as I read that and kind of chuckled, I put down the Ninja Turtle print, and I was holding a fucking Whole Foods uh, newsletter, and I'm like, like, like a coupon thing for Whole Foods, and he's at Whole Foods, and I'm like, "What the Ooh. fuck?" So then I. I sent, I was like, are you serious? This was right underneath that. And I sent that back to him. And and I have pictures of all this stuff, by the way, I'm going to give to you. You can put it in the show notes if you want. <laughs> uh, but uh, so these are, this is all the same five minutes. The fucking Ninja Turtles just happened. That just happened. The Whole Foods, th- Whole Foods thing happens. Then my friend Craig, who is like my synchronicity guy, we talk about syncs all the time, but I haven't been able to tell him any of this yet. He has still, right now, not heard. So any if he of- listened to this, he'd get all new information? He would, yeah. He's- hey, Craig. <laughs> Hi, hey. Craig. Hey. hey who knows if he's listening to this? I think he probably will. You never know who, how much someone listens to. There's some people that don't listen to podcasts. It just I doesn't know. come up with them. It's like, well, I have this job where I don't listen to it, and then I get home, and I watch the show, and then I go to bed. There's never room for it but you you travel a lot so you find yourself in places where you do need to listen to long form content a lot and painting dude like painting that's like all i want to do like that will get me through 12 hours of paintings like that's so easy yeah you know um but yeah so he sends me a text right after that a second later and it's the cover of this uh of Fathom Five, full Fathom Five, um, by Clutch, and, and the cover. Is that a band? Yeah, Cl- okay. Clutch is this band, and um, and <laughs> the cover of the album is like a ship on a water, right? And then it, you see all the underwater life, and then there's this tentacle coming out of the bottom, and it's holding this glowing light streak. Ooh! <laughs> so it, so all of a sudden it ties in the glow stick and the tentacle, and I'm like. Ah, like, it's gluing whoa. them all together. Yeah, and I was like, okay, um, I think I'm having a malfunction. So I was like, all right, outside stimuli, done. I'm cutting off everything that's interacting with me right now. Okay. Why like, would you want to cut it off, though? Because I would I would just want to keep going till I 
till I'm in the spaceship. So it's exact, I'm actually in there. It's exactly what you. What, what did you? What was the example you said earlier? That's like this. Oh, crowd surfing. So it's exactly like that, where you're like, oh, I should have stayed longer. I shouldn't have gotten oh, scared. Oh yeah. But for a second there, I was. I was like, oh, it's too much. Like it was just overwhelming me. So it wasn't like I was terrified. I just wanted a break for a second, and I was like, okay, I'm. I'm gonna put my phone away. I'm not going to listen to any podcasts. And like I said earlier, d- wait, did I bring... Oh. I, you didn't bring up a big one? You gave me a perfect uh, thing to go back to earlier when I was going to say the, synchron- the synchronicity that happened before the Ninja Turtle that I was already reeling before the Ninja Turtle thing because this other thing had happened where I was taking in the whole trip of Hawaii and I was just feeling, wow, that was so fucking cool. And it really made me like it reaffirmed my love of psychedelic experience and how much it adds to my life. And I was just feeling this awe for the universe. And I was like, you know, I need a trip box again. I used to have a lunch pail that I just put all like these mementos and like pictures I would take and, um, you know, things people would give me. Like I held this rock all the way through Hawaii. It just with my buddy. So now it's in the fucking trip box, right? All these things. And, so I, I find a box, I find this cool wooden box, and I start doing that and put the rock in and I put a couple pictures I had and fucking all of a sudden I find this book of haikus that a really good friend of mine who used to sing for this day forward, Mike, he's like the sage enigma kind of guy, very tapped in, but also just the best fucking, just one of the best people I know. And he made me this great gift of like 28 haikus that he wrote. He just wrote them in a book, a little notebook, and gave them to me. It's like a haiku book. And I used to like have it on tour with me. I used to have it in my pocket all the time because I would read one a day. And it just kept me connected to him. And it, and it just would always make me laugh or it would be like a nice, like brilliant truth or whatever. So I find the haiku book and I'm like, oh, my God, like I've been looking for this. I lost it in one of our moves over the last few years. And like, this is going in the trip box. Even though it doesn't associate with trips, it's, like, so perfect to read these during trips. So I'm, like, I'm going to go put this in the box. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to fucking read one. And I just flip it open. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, man. I should pull it up. I'm going to pull it up so I don't fuck it up because it's it's that great. Like, yeah, you got to nail the, the 575 uh, <laughs> meter, if that's what it's called. Yeah. it's. I mean, haikus in general, I love and... He's one of these people that, for whatever reason, the format just works for him so well. Um, so here it is. And he wrote this in 2011 during, um, yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you after. Join the new movement. Come dressed as an octopus. <laughs> Octopi Philly. <laughs> and he wrote that during Occupy Philly. Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. So... He lived really close to Occupy, the camp, one of the camps, and he just wrote that. He just thought, thought it was funny. And uh, so that was what I flipped to when I was about to put it in the box. And that was the first thing that had me, what the fucking, before the Ninja Turtle happened, and I sent that to everybody. Um, so all those things had happened. And the reason I had to bring this up and explain it is because the trip box now plays a role. If you remember when I first started talking to you, I said... Have you read Tao Lin's new book, Trip? Um, you know, whatever. It's this guy I love, one of my favorite authors. Always wrote fiction stories, but then got completely obsessed with McKenna. Had his whole worldview change from like existential dread to wonder and awe. Like kicked like Xanax, uh, Adderall, like opiate addiction, and went into psychedelics and discovered like all these things that had been there the whole time but he wrote this amazing book about it and I it really impacted me talked about punk rock being his first introduction introduction to like alienation I like introduction too <laughs> yeah introduction um, let me introduce you to that <laughs> uh, kind of works um, so punk rock was his intro to aliens alienation like oh, alienation. feeling feeling alienation and and also like like distrust of uh, authority and you know he just is like basically tracing back what led him to be open to psychedelics and it's this great book and it impacted me and i i reached out to him and was just like hey i love this book it's amazing and we just had a few back and forth but he's super kind and i went to see him have a reading right 
um, at Powell's Books in Portland, one of the coolest bookstores ever. And I go to see him do a reading. It was two days before I left for Australia, Hawaii tour. And I go see him deliver this speech. Um, well, he did a reading from Trip and talked a lot about McKenna. And he took Q&A from people asking him about different psychedelics and his drug use and, and about what he loved about McKenna and all this stuff. And he talked about going, he had like an adventure to go meet Terrence's ex-wife, um, Catherine. And, uh, my wife, Kat, <laughs> yeah, Kat. which we have this conversation about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she has a plant drawing class in California and he went all the way out there and did the class and like wrote about it. It's a really cool story. Um, but anyway, like I go to this thing, I bring him some weird, he, cause I know he likes random old books that look like nobody like ever reproduced them. They just like have one pressing, but they're cool. So I found a few of those and I brought those to him. And I give him like a joint and like some pins and stuff. And he gave me this photograph, right? Um, at least that's, I perceived it as just a random photograph because the band has even done this where we'll get a, a, a like an instant camera and just take a bunch of photos and then give them out to people. Like Just no purpose photo, like yeah. here's tree and this sidewalk. Is, yeah. Just, here you go. Exactly. So that's what I thought this was. He just gave me this thing and it looked like just a, in my mind, the way I cataloged it was, oh, this is a picture of an illustration that Tao thought was cool. And that's a very Tao thing to do as well, as far as like the way he writes and like, you know, it, it just, to me, I did not think much about what it was, but like how it came to be, right? It's like, all right, this cool little thing that he gave me because he took it. Didn't even think about what the image was. And it was, I just put it in the back of my copy of Trip, which I took on tour with me. I was rereading it like re almost three reads now and I've notated in it and just like, I, I like to make notes in books. And <laughs> so this thing was with me the whole fucking time. It was in the back of this book and I go to get it to put it in the trip box. I'm like, all right, no stimuli, no outside stimuli, nothing. I'm just gonna go grab this thing that's in my fucking backpack out of this book and I fucking open it and I look at it and it is a fucking illustration of an of a sleeping octopus holding a stuffed animal of an octopus <laughs> yeah and so I just lost my shit basically just kind of like slowly started crying out of almost just like awe and beauty and feeling like this is amazing. Oh, cool. But he actually, he made this. Like, I, I contacted him and I was like, why? He didn't know either. No. He didn't know any of it. No, no, nothing. This happened three weeks before we ever took the mushrooms. I, and, I, and I had it sitting in my book the That's entire so time. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he probably didn't even know why he did it. No. Something contacted him to... Yeah, he's to like, make oh, it. He's like, oh, it was a collage I made out of paper. I cut these pieces of paper up, and then I made six prints of it. And you just got one because you asked the question during the Q and A. And I gave it, I gave those six out that day. That's crazy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And then I was like, oh, weird. Uh, like someone yesterday heard me tell the one story about the octopus chameleon, and they DM'd me a page from trip where he notes that this is a topic that Terrence McKenna talks about. He just, he listed like 30 things. Right. And just in that list, this person that had sent me the DM picture of the page from trip, he circled the word octopi as something McKenna talked about. And I was like, yeah, fuck, I don't really remember. That. Yeah. Cause they, they, from what I understand, it's, we thought they were just doing camouflage with their mm -hmm. with their little I don't know Roshark visual uh, language, but they have they have a form of telepathy where they speak with the patterns on their. I feel like I feel like you should just read that. That's that's McKenna's quote about octopi. On octopi, nature in her evolutionary and morphogenetic richness has offered a compelling model for us to follow in the shamanic task of resacralization and self-transformation that lies ahead. In other words, the totemic animal image for the future human model to model is the octopus. This is because cephalopods, 
The squids and octopi, lowly creatures though they may seem, have perfected a form of communication that is both psychedelic and telepathic. Well, an inspiring model for the human communications of the future would be the octopus. Yeah. But they're too small, though, and they live in water. But <laughs> communication-wise, man, if they are aliens, that's, that's such a bunk deal if they're way smarter than us and telepathic and they get here and they're like, we escaped our planet. And then there's just these bipedal apes that still haven't come into oneness yet. It's like, what's this? Let's fry it and eat it. It tastes okay, I guess, when it's fried, I guess. What's it doing? Does it look scared? It can't feel. It's an animal. You want to hear something even more fucked up? I've only had calamari once in my life, and I immediately projectile vomited. Oh, I really? Kid, I kid you not. It was cannibalism. <laughs> you couldn't do it. Or not actual cannibalism. I was my but, spirit animal, I guess. Yeah. So it's 4.04, mm-hmm. I mean, when we're taping this, and the premiere of uh, the Psychonautics film, which we're going to go to, mm-hmm. is uh, going to happen soon. So yeah, I want to make sure we get in there in time, but... I don't know, like, like, just we'll start getting into wrap it up mode. Like, mm-hmm. just figure out some stuff if we want to talk about before we leave, just to make sure we we tie up all the loose ends. I think it's been a fantastic episode as it is. Even if we chopped it in half, I still think it's a fantastic episode. Fuck yeah! But uh, just I love you know me. I love squeezing out every last bit of content that we can. Yeah. Um. Oh man. No, we should probably go now. It's yeah. like thirty seven. But. Anyway, uh, so uh, listeners, you can find Colin on uh, Colin Circa is your Instagram handle. Yep, and, and he makes too. beautiful paintings. And you can check out all the Circa Survive albums and uh, Psychic Babble. And uh, yeah. I don't know, you can just look up all all of all of his expression of of everything. And I don't know, is there any last last words you want to leave with listeners? Did you have a good time? What do you make of all this? I'm just thrilled to be here. Oh, awesome. Uh oh. What the, is the sound it's isn't. So cool. Yeah, it's like. I think it's we're merging. St- Are we merging into. Is, it, is this the singularity? Oh my god. <laughs> we begin cycle two in next higher octave. Good night, everyone. Keep those pants safe. I'm trying to have like a, a thing like keep it crispy or something. I need some kind of thing where you leave it and tie your shoes to a doorknob and then uh, call your mother an asshole. No, don't do any of that stuff. That's bad. Uh, do you got any n- name a thing? What's a thing people can do? A thing? Just like in, like keep it crispy. Like name just a stupid line or something. Um, smell your farts. Yeah, smell your farts, everyone. All right. Good night.